Okay, so now we come to the formal part of the day and I'd like to invite Andrew Morrison up to the stage and he will um, take over. Thank you, Christine. I actually didn't know you from Southland, so thanks for telling us that earlier in the day. Um, I will start, seeing we're under a bit of a time constraint. Um, welcome to the Beef and Lamb New Zealand 20th Annual Meeting. Ko takatima te waka, ko hokanui te manga, ko mataura te awa, ko naitā te iwi, ko pukitaraki te marae, ko Andrew Morrison aho. I'm Chairman of Beef and Lamb, Andrew Morrison, and I'd like to welcome you all here today. Quite interesting that mihi, uh, sorry, the, the waiata we sung earlier, Charles, thanks for doing that and creating that, kind of appropriate for today. The, the man may pass from the land, but the whenua is still there. So the man may pass from the organisation, but the organisation will continue. So I just thought it was kind of interesting today as we sang that. Um, any dignitaries here today? I haven't been provided a list. I do not recognise any MPs in the room. But if I have missed you, I apologise for that. I'd just like to take the time to introduce my board as we're going into this. And I just want to give context, guys. We have rejigged the day today for the importance of the remits because we wanted to give everyone a chance to have a chat. The board is here to listen, and that's why we've rejigged the day. We do have time constraints, and we're putting the 20-minute limit on each remit. Otherwise, we might be sitting here all day. But as I introduce my board, I just want to give you context that the board is here to listen to the remits, and that is the, that is the, uh, the intention of the day. So we'll skip through chairman's reports, we'll chip, skip through CR reports, and then we will give due and adequate time to the remits. Okay, so my board today here, uh, we have Nikki Hislop. Um, if you could stand up, please. Central South Island, Kate Ackland, Northern South Island. Where are you, Kate? Kate over there. George Tatham. Yep, George is, uh, was retiring at this AGM, but due to the uh, events of Cyclone Gabriel, George has committed to stay on the board for another month or so until we can activate the election there. We needed to give those four candidates time to sort their own businesses out during the cyclone and then make a decision when it was appropriate to have the next elections. After that, we've got Scott Gow, Western North Island, and we have um, Martin Coop. Now, Baden, you still here? Or has Baden had to head off and do stuff? Baden, as our independent director, you got to meet Baden this morning. He's excellent. Pete Connolly is also here, our new MIA representative. We have one other board member on Beef and Lamb New Zealand, Alex Gio. He is also a uh, MIA appointee, but Alex is an apology today. Also like to David Walker, can you just stand up? You've been referenced in, with having Van Gallis in the room. So, but David is not here beef and lamb, but David is our New Zealand Meat Board Director. And it was great to get a context of the calibre of the sort of people that we have sitting on our New Zealand Meat Board. So thanks for joining us here today, David. Okay. So I can confirm that we have a quorum of 50 farmers in person and represented by proxies, proxies or who have voted online. Um, we'll do the formal part of the meeting now. Um, any apologies that people would like registered? Dougal Stringer, yep, from Southland, yes. Hang on, wait a minute. David Kidd, yep. Sandra Faulkner. Roger Dalrymple. You catch all that, Cross? Yep. Also have an apology, as I say, from Alex Gio, our um, Beef and Lamb Director, and one from Jim Vanderpoel from uh, Chairman Dairy NZ, and one from Nathan Guy, Chairman of Meat Industry Association. Two, Jason? David Turner. Sarah Coogan. Jared, you left your home to do some work. <laughs> Okay, is that all the apologies? The meeting happy to accept those apologies? Thank you. 
Okay, the minutes from the uh, online meeting, 2022 annual meeting held on the 24th of March, 2022. The copy were included in your meeting pack. They were approved as being a true and accurate record of that meeting. And they were approved at the subsequent beef and lamb uh, meeting after that in, in April, 2022. Any matters arising from those minutes that people needed to bring up? Are you guys working this or am I working this? I can do that. Okay, if not, we will move into the meeting formal. Okay, so the agenda for the meeting is Chairman's report, CEO report. As I say, we've tried to condense these so we've got plenty of time today to have discussions. We'll open the floor for questions and then we will move into company, resolu uh, company resolutions and then the farmer remit. So there'll be a short lunch break for 20 minutes at about 12.45. When then we'll carry on with remits, then we'll do general business and acknowledgements. Is the uh, attendees happy with that agenda as it sits? Thank you. Cool. Okay. I'll move into my chairman's report. Hey, look, I'm proud to be standing here in front of you today. It's a pivotal time in our sector, and uh, that is on lots of reasons. It was interesting hearing Van Gallies talk about Nick's family of plague and pestilence and COVID and conflict. We are living in a world that none of us have lived in before, and that is the reality of the world we're living in. I really like Van Gallies' I don't deal with the world that I wish I was in. I deal with the world that is reality. And I think that is the core of the issue of why we're going to have some quite robust discussions later in the day. I don't live in the world that I wish it is. I live in the world as it is at the moment. So in the context of that, that is why we've allocated you know, a lot of time. Welcome back, Baden. Um, we've allocated a lot of time to the remits. It's appropriate that levy payers ask questions and hold the Beef and Lamb Board to account. That is appropriate. And it's appropriate that we follow process. So that is excellent. And we do, uh, we do give thanks that you know, we're following process. I have every confidence, I won't be in the room at the end of this meeting, but I have every confidence that the board will listen to the discussions today and then make the appropriate response. That is what today is about. So it's an opportunity for the board to listen for people to put counter views up or have other views, have them expressed so the board can understand how they will go about making their decisions in relation to the remit. It's not been an easy year for our sector, has it? Um, we've come through a period of, you know, we look back and Beef and Lamb did a piece of work uh, two years ago and it was the most profitable decade the sector had had in 60 years. That has turned around pretty fast, hasn't it? And it's feel like we've all taken a bit of a big financial slapping this year. And that's on the back of significant inflationary uh, costs into our businesses, softening commodity markets and external regulations, uh, clouding our confidence in sector. So look, that is significant and upheaval. The challenge is we as a board have had to operate in the world that we don't wish it was the reality of what it is. So we've broken our um, chairman's report and CEO into the two pieces. I will discuss the contentious uh, political decisions we've had to make or the advocacy space, and then Sam will take you through the rest of the business. Um, I've had multiple conversations with lots of farmers over the through all this regulatory change, as we have as a board. One thing I can tell you is, and it's always an old saying, you get a room of 10 farmers, do you think they're all going to agree on things? And that's the simple challenge of the period that we're going through. These are really really challenging debates and to get consensus on them is not always going to be possible. Boards have to make decisions and that's what we've been charged with and that's what we're doing. Okay, so one of the most important elements of our role is to work on behalf of the sector as a whole so that we, the sector as a whole can get on with doing what they are really excellent at and they are really excellent at farming and so we have been asked by our farmers to step into the space of advocacy and we've been asked by our farmers to partner with other sector groups so that we don't fight with each other and we go to the uh, table with a really strong voice. That's what you've asked us to do 
And that's what we've been doing. There's been a lot of discussion around how effective our advocacy is. Could I challenge as farmers that if the only difference they two, you have to do two things differently on your farm since the inception of this Labor government. One is to do your 190 in-cap reporting, and the other is to do a, get a wintering consent for your winter grazing. Those are the two things that you have to do. So you challenge the effectiveness of our advocacy as a collective. There's only two things you are doing differently on your farm. There was a lot of stuff in negotiation, and therein lies the rub. Okay, so I'm going to briefly run through the challenges that we've been facing, and I'm just going to put them into boxes. So I'm going to put them first into the carbon farming box. I want to give you clarity that we have never supported carbon farming, and right from day one, the Climate Change Response Act, we got thrown out of Minister Shaw's office for the vigilance in which we argued the point that once you let this out of the box, there is no way to pull it back in. Minister Shaw kept contesting there is a way to bring it back in. We've got limits. We've always said when you allow 100% carbon offsets, how are you going to stop that? Our belief this was not addressing the core problem and you will far overshoot your targets as we've seen as you set a carbon price. I want to be quite clear, we've been consistent on that and on record We've never supported carbon farming, and that's one of the intentions or one of the reasons why we've got the current Back Kiwi Farmers campaign, because most New Zealanders don't back carbon farming. Let's be quite clear, though, integration uh, and sensible integration of trees into farms for both you and for climate change mitigation, we are not against. But carbon farming, and so it's always the construct of the ETS is the core legislation that we will continue to argue with government about. We did get some sort of a relief that the, the government did say, they, 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 okay, we're starting to listen. We have seen no changes to date and the practice is continuing. This links into the next conversation of emissions pricing which is Haywaka Noah. Now, 2019, let's be quite clear, you may not think we got wins, but we got wins. We are the only country in the world that has got split gas addressed in legislation. We did not agree with the target at the time, so let's be quite clear around that, but split gas is in legislation. We have committed that we will continue work with all industry bodies and other groups to get that target linked to the warming impact. So I just want to make sure that we're quite clear on that. And the other thing is on that 2019, the legislation still sits there that has to be repelled that agriculture will go into the ETS. This is not a blind threat. It still sits in legislation in the ETS that agriculture will enter the ETS. It has to be taken out. So we have to put forth a credible alternative or they will make a simple choice. So let's be quite clear about that. This is not a sort of Damocles that we've flippantly held over our sector's heads because we want it. It's not the world that we wish we operated in. It's the world that we do operate in. Okay, so if we had failed, you would have been in the ETS in 2022. I just want to give some context around that. So in constructing that credible alternative, there was questions around the, the importance of recognising all sequestrations, which is insetting, which is the commercial model that the, the silver fern farms are using, versus the regulatory model of Haywaka Kanoa. And where the misalignment in there is the government's recognition of what is all legitimate, call it insets, call it offsets, call it whatever you want. That is where the rub is, and that's what we've always committed to our sector, that we will never sign you up to a bad deal on multiple points. The first one being, unless we don't get recognition of sequestration or an understanding of that tra transition of sequestration into ETS, we won't sign up to it. Okay, the other thing we've committed, we won't sign up to a price that will compromise your business. Now, we get criticised because we put out a report that said that 20% of our businesses will be compromised. There was a reason why we put that report out. And then there was a reason why government went and did another report and go, oh, actually, you're right. So we will never sign up to something that, uh, that compromises as, as sector on price and on recognition of genuine sequestration. 
The other thing is you cannot set up a system that's not equitable, and that goes back to the target conversation. If they set the targets wrong and they're asking agriculture to do more than other sectors, of course we can never support that. And then there's the inter-industry sector equity of how you treat people when some of our farmers don't have the ability through regulatory processes to use offsetting on their farms. So we can never accept that. So that's another conversation. Okay, so that's the Haywaka stuff. That's the carbon farming. That's the Haywaka stuff. Essential fresh water, we all know that was a dog's breakfast the day that that came out, and we worked collectively um, with the Essential, uh, with, the, with the wintering group in Southland to get the changes around pugging, metrics, sow down dates, and that was in conjunction with Federated Farmers, Dairy NZ, Fishing Game, and local farmers. So that's all been back worked. The areas that we are still struggling with government is the slope maps and the stock exclusion. But as I say, to date, as farmers, there's only two things we're having to do different, and one of them is get that wintering consent. We have seen first cuts. We agreed with government at the time that you could either get a wintering consent or go for a farm plan. Government has not delivered their farm plan side of the agreement we made. Deeply frustrated with that, and so they're forcing us into getting a consent. So I just want to be quite clear we're not happy with that. Biodiversity rules have not been introduced. A lot of conversations around SNAs. SNAs have been under RMA since 1991 and have been in place in most regions since 1991. This is not a new thing. What the current government was going to do was amend the criteria of the SNAs, which we found highly invasive and never supported. Okay, so those are the really contentious stuff that we've been talking about under the next, oh, sorry, over the past six years. We didn't get to operate in a world that we wished we lived in. We operate in a world that this government has tried to impose on us. And we have acted in your interests to get the best outcome. And I want to convey that, that this has been all consuming for our board and our management on this journey. That's only half of what we do. We had an ex example here this morning of the R&D stuff we're doing, and we had an example, and we'll talk through it in my final. I'll, I'm going to do a bit of an end of, end of my life speech at the end of the general business. But the, uh, the conclusion of those or the, the ratification of those FTAs are just going to be massive for our sector. China plus strategy. Can you imagine a world if we live in, move into a geopolitical challenge of choosing between two superpowers? We have to be provisioning in new markets. Currently, as we sit today, you've got beef access for 454 tonne of beef into the UK market. What Van Gallis and his team has delivered 12,000 on day one, climbing to free, full liberalisation of beef access into the UK after 15 years and we've picked up additional sheep meat access. Quite significant as you put your China Plus strategy in place. So look, it's been quite a challenging period. I can't say it's been easy, and I'm not going to stand in front of you sort of saying we've got everything right, so let's go through the remits. But I'd just like to table my chairman's report. Well, that's my half, and now Sam will work through a lot of the uh, stuff that he's been doing, or well, the rest of the stuff we're doing as a business. Sam will cover off financials, and then we'll take questions. Uh, Tina Koto Kato, Beef and Lamb, New Zealand's vision given to us by farmers is sustainable and profitable farmers, thriving rural communities valued by all New Zealanders. In starting, I want to recognise that profitability and vibrant communities are two areas where farmers are really challenged at the moment. Whether it's cost related, a soft schedule, the threat of far uh, carbon farming gutting your local community, maybe isolated in your community dealing with the after effects of cyclones, hail and Gabrielle, or in the south facing your fourth year of dry, it's tough. But I also want to encourage you too. The stats tell us that you absolutely are sustainable farmers and that New Zealanders do absolutely value you and recognise the role that you play in both community and the economy. 
We've seen this in the absolute outpouring of support through the recent weather events. We have three priorities underpinning Beef and Land New Zealand's vision. Supporting farming excellence, championing the sector and increasing market returns. Andrew Morrison has transversed Beef and Land New Zealand's advocacy activities. I'm going to give you further insight into championing the sector, supporting farming excellence and increasing market returns. Starting with farming excellence, roughly 40% of Beef and Lamb New Zealand's budget is in research, development, extension and training. In research, we're coming to the end of a five-year Hill Country Futures program. Driven by in-depth views of 170 farmers, this program is about understanding their ambition, telling their stories and developing resources to help them navigate successfully uh, into the future. The outputs vary from the best forages and fertilisers through to a mental toolbox for farmers to assess success through a health and wellness lens. This has absolutely been a by farmers, uh, for farmers project. We've embarked on another farmer driven project with the ambition of eradicating uh, FE out of New Zealand. Ambitious, yes, but it's an extremely well designed program with 14 industry partners on board and strong support from MPI. We're really excited about the prospects. You've met Ginny Dodinsky today. As well as delivering uh, Wormwise, Ginny is working with our R&D team to develop and deliver a strategy to minimise and manage drench resistance and prolong the efficacy of our limited family of drenches. This is farmers' number one animal health priority. More than 700 farmers were involved in defining breeding objectives for our new Informing New Zealand Beef Programme. This 16 million seven year program with six and a half million of MPI funding supported by the New Zealand Meat Board aims to take our world class sheep genetics tools and apply them to our grass fed beef systems. There's also a significant uh, focus on dairy beef. We're confident this program will deliver $450 million of increased income to beef farmers over the next 25 years. We're continuing to invest in methane with a JV investment partner, partner excuse me, Zoeta's taking potential inhibitors the next step. And we've recently secured $2.3 million of funding from MPI to quickly test for and identify those rams with lower methane emissions to ensure as many farmers as possible can source them. Oops, sorry, I've got one too many. Oh, that's good. <clears throat> our world-class extension and comms team, supported, our, supported by our farming council, our farmer council, sorry, did an amazing job in 2022. From connecting with 15,000 farmers face to face, through to 29,000 downloads of our digital resources via website. For example, our 29 uh, online learning modules had 13,000 sessions and 3,200 hours of use in 2022. And our e-diaries, already the most opened and read newsletter in the sector, took a 13% jump. Our product development and extension team continue to innovate to get more bottom line tools to farmers in a way that suits farmers. In championing the sector, we're focused on identifying great farmers, telling their story, connecting with consumers and community, and backing our farmers with the facts. We launched the Beef and Lamb New Zealand Awards, and they're already a key annual highlight for our sector. It's great to see our Rural Champion Award winner, Sandra Matthews, in the room today. We also celebrated our Māori Farmer and Young Māori Farmer of the Year. More outstanding performance. Farmer time and open farms have brought farmers and urban communities together with great success. At the same time, we're making sure the public knows uh, the facts about how we farm through our Making Meat Better website and backing our sector. I just need the sheep. Uh, backing our sector. <clears throat> Excuse me. Just got to find my spot and backing our sector through the Backing Farmers campaign. If you haven't signed on, I strongly encourage you to do so. Lastly, we continue to grow the evidence behind our products. Working with the Meat Industry Association, we're identifying the youth 
the unique health and nutrition characteristics of New Zealand grass-fed beef, and our beef and lamb life cycle analysis has proven our world-class carbon footprint. On connecting with consumers, I'm pleased to say that our joint venture with processors and retailers, Beef and Lamb New Zealand Inc., will be launching a new com consumer campaign in April. It's focused on connection and confidence, increasing the connection that consumers have with our beef and lamb by igniting that taste and occasion uh, sensation and giving them confidence with health, nutrition, environmental and animal health uh, and welfare credentials we know they want. Kid Ark Greich uh, from Inc. is in the room today. Uh, Kid, if you just want to raise your hand so people can see it, and I'm sure he'd be happy to fill you in on the detail. Kid, in conjunction with ourselves, will be on the road talking to farmers about it soon. <clears throat> and in, to increase market returns, we focus on unlocking new markets, removing barriers to trade, and in target markets, creating awareness and a preference for New Zealand's grass-fed beef and lamb. We've had some big trade wins on the back of tenacity of our staff, partnering MIA, supporting MFAT and MPI as they negotiated two free trade deals. In addition to increased sheep meat access, the UK FTA sees 12,000 tonnes of beef at entry into force, rising to 60,000 tonnes by year 15, and after year 15, no tariffs or quotas on our beef or sheep meat. Is Van Gala still in the room? Right, I can say this now. The EU FTA, though a disappointing result, uh, will see us with about 11,000 tonnes of beef access by the end of year seven. We've got increased uh, sheep meat access there too. Following ratification of these FTAs, we'll have 76% of our markets covered by FTAs, a remarkable achievement for Beef and Lamb New Zealand working in combo with government over many years. Note though that Van Gallis said FTAs don't stop barriers being put up. Uh, a new report by Beef and Lamb New Zealand and MIA has estimated that we still have $1.5 billion of non-tariff measures that add cost or reduce margins, and we're working with the MIA to prioritise and advocate for their removal. China has the biggest amount of these non-tariff barriers, and uh, in combination, again, with the MIA, uh, we have a significant investment in gathering intelligence and identifying opportunities and priorities for us to negotiate uh, those away. Taste Pure Nature goes from strength to strength. Launched in 2019 and focused on conscious foodies in our highest growth markets, the stats speak for themselves. Through partnering with a growing list of meat companies, Taste Pure Nature campaigns continue to grow the awareness and aspiration to buy New Zealand grass-fed beef and lamb in US and China. In US, uh, awareness of New Zealand's unique farming practices now sits 90% higher than in 2019. Aspiration to buy New Zealand grass-fed beef and lamb has increased by 18% and 10% respectively. In 2022, our paid media has reached 116.9 million people and our food truck has driven a real increase in sales. In China... New Zealand is now the most seen and heard country of origin for beef, recognised by 44% of consumers surveyed. You'll see on screen the pure box vending machine. Beef and Lamb New Zealand developed these recipes and then trialled the most desirable meals in vending machines. More than 35 million consumers saw this promotion. We're also now exploring the potential for these meals in supermarkets and convenience stores. Though, overall, the, though the overall investment is small by global standards, independent analysis has identified a 7.9 to 1 return for every beef and lamb New Zealand dollar invested in Taste Pure Nature. Speaking of finances, uh, my last slide, and I'll refer you to page uh, 44 of our annual report, uh, just gives you a summary of beef and lamb uh, New, Ze New Zealand's financial status for the 2022 year. 2022 had a planned deficit of 280k compared to a surplus of in 2021 of 1.5 uh, 1.1 million. 
Uh, $30 million worth of levy income from you as farmers leverages another $8 million of, of other income uh, into our books. Our balance sheet was in good shape with equity of $24.5 million. Like you, though, we are faced with financial headwinds, income pressure and inflationary costs. And like you, we're cutting our cloth and looking for extra revenue outside the business. In closing, Beef and Lamb New Zealand's purpose is to deeply understand our farmers and the issues that affect them, to take action and to make an impact for our farmers. I'm confident that across the activities Andrew and I have covered today, that is just what we're doing. My thanks to the dedicated and passionate people I have within my Beef and Land New Zealand team, my thanks to industry partners, and my thanks to you, our farmers, for the opportunity to work for you. It's a privilege. Tina koto, tina koto, tina tato kata. Thank you. Okay, can we take any questions on the reports? Nils? Yep, there'll be a... Do you have, uh, your, state, have your state your name that we can just... Oh, Nils Hanson, uh, Taranaki Sheep Farmer. Um, it appears that our community has an expectation that you should have followed Groundswell into the trenches um, of protest. As a levy organisation with consent from government, what are the rules, the actual rules that you have to engage with or engagement that you have to follow? Is our community naive in thinking that you have the right as a levy body given permission to act by government um, <laughs> to operate in that space rather than giving government good advice and um, trying to hold them up because it just feels like beef and lamb is suffering a bit from um, an expectation that you should be harder and stronger and, and more anti-government. And I don't really know that you've got the ability to do that. Is that... Look, that's a really interesting question because there's a lot in that now. So, look, we are not constrained by the uh, commodity levies construct. We can we can take a position and represent that to government. And if we thought that protesting was the way to get a result, we would have that choice. Um, what we heard from farmers is, so let's go back to step one. First, they wanted us in advocacy. Second, they wanted us to partner with industry partners so that we took a strong united voice. Industry partners like Federated Farmers, Dairy NZ, are the two ones that people have always believed we have a conflict of interest or we, um, we don't align our views. Now, historically, that may have been the case in the water quality discussions, and we, we may still end up in points of conflict in the water quality discussion because success looks different to different sectors sometimes. We are trying not to do that because it just weakens how we represent our views to government. We all want the same things. We all want a vibrant, successful sector, not, um, not hamstrung or, or financially crippled by government regulation. And then we choose a pathway, different organisations, to try and get that result. Does, does that answer? Yeah. Any other questions? Sam or Cros, can I just take the opportunity while we're here doing a financial report to address an issue that quite often comes up because it goes to where, but like your question there, Nils, is quite often people think that um, we have a, 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 a revenue stream from government that compromises our position. So would Cros or Sam like to stand up here and just highlight what our external other income is because it actually all pertains to research programs? Correct, Andrew. So, our, around three, four million dollars. Sorry, thanks, Jase. Around three to four million dollars a year comes through in the research programs. Uh, the larger one is the Hill Country Farming, uh, Hill Country Futures Project that we heard about this morning. Uh, we're starting to see the emerging uh, or informing New Zealand beef project uh, come in from uh, MPI's SFFF fund. And uh, with facial uh, eczema, we'll be starting to see or uh, getting funding coming through from those sources as well. Uh, so they're, they're really the uh, three big ones there. Uh, basically those, when they're negotiated, they don't come with any caveats and whatever we do. So uh, 
we don't actually compromise anything else across the business. So I just want to make that really clear. Uh, and look, the, the other sort of sources really range around $4 million, which comes from a lot of work we do across associated and sister organisations. So you would be aware of the New Zealand Meat Board. Uh, rather than replicating resources, we actually supply staff from beef and lamb to undertake quota management, uh, quota uh, specific sort of trade policy work, uh, and that's all funded out of beef and lamb and paid for uh, by quota holders uh, on the meat board side. So that's almost a million dollars uh, in those activities as well. And, uh, and then lastly, there's sort of uh, economic service work. So we're working um, and gain fees for their work around... Uh, information that's produced out of farm data or farm surveys, farm data information, uh, national standard costs uh, for the IRD. And then we just have some synergies that we work with the deer industry. You know, we provide them sort of financial services, uh, other support services in the back end. So we really look to try and leverage it to the teams uh, that we've got across the sector. So I think hopefully that gives a bit of background. Look, I just want to take the opportunity to actually front foot this because I read a lot about this and as I might put it into the people have a view or a misunderstanding around this sometimes. Any additional questions, please ask and come to our organisation and we can provide you clarity around that. Somebody says that if they tell a message that our engagement with government is then uh, linked to uh, financial remuneration, I just wanted to put that to bed, Okay. Okay, any more questions? If not, I will uh, have the two reports accepted, uh, adopted, and I will move on to the next part of the AGM, which is the, uh, we'll do the company resolution first and then move into the, uh, the remits. So giving a broad overview of the company resolution, the, re the resolutions have been proposed to farmers in the notice of the annual meeting and the explanatory notes have been mailed out to the farmers. As the resolutions have been proposed in this notice and voted on by post and online, we don't need a mover and a seconder here today. In the interest of time, I'll pass the resolution first and then we'll move, or no, I won't pass it, I'll propose it. It's been voted on anyway, and then we'll move into the remits. We won't waste time at, uh, reading the remits. You will have all be here, you will be familiar with them. What we'll do is we put a 20 minute time frame on each remit just so that we might get through the day. I've got Lindy Nelson down here as a timekeeper. If you guys are all accepting of that, and um, then we will ring a bell at 15 minutes. There's nothing worse than some guy more or girl more incessantly ringing a bell just to unnerve people. So we will ring a bell at 15 minutes and that will give an indication of time left and we'll ring a bell at two minutes. What would be great is uh, we hear from the remit presenters and then we open up the floor so that we can hear different views or supportive views or whatever in relation to the remits that are presented, because that gives the board the flavour when they go away and have to consider what they're going to do after the fact. Is that okay, guys? Okay. Um, as I say, voting has occurred online predominantly. You can vote in the room, and so at the end of each farmer or either the resolution or the farmer remits, somebody will collect your voting packs if you've got them. Cross Spooner, what were you going to say? Okay, so somebody won't click them just at the end of the meeting. <laughs> just go down there and do that would be great. Um, as I say, um, if you speak, wish to speak to the resolutions, uh, please wait till the microphone comes to you and please ensure you state your name and where you're from. As I say, I've explained the 20 minutes. What I do want to say is beef and lamb's not going to take the opportunity. We're not getting into like a back and forth here. Um, we've already posted our response to the remits and, and the way you vote all online. You've seen Beef and Lamb's response. There's no real value in us spending a bunch of our time responding to remits today. We are here to listen. The only thing that Beef and Lamb may do is if we felt there was any sort of something that may need clarified, then we may take that opportunity so that then people had a, a view of what uh, a, a, a fulsome view. 
Okay, um, so company resolution one, that the Constitution of Beaton Lamb New Zealand requires that we put a resolution to the vote at the annual meeting for the appointment of an auditor. This is shown on the screen. Actually, before we do this, can I just apologise? I haven't welcomed our live stream guests. Sorry about that. And the other thing I did want to call out, Lindsay and Linda McNamara, I wanted to recognise you. This is your how many AGM that you've attended? Lindsay and uh, Linda have come from Southland and this, they've been attending Beef and Lamb AGM since 2015. So I want to acknowledge that and thank you for coming today. <laughs> and my apologies that I did that so late in the meeting. Okay, uh, the resolution as it sits on the screen, can I open this for any discussion? I thought so. <laughs> okay. If people have got no questions, you are able to vote or drop your voting pack in the box as you leave at the end of the day. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Hamish, question? No, I thought there were voting packs in them, but no. Right. Most people vote online. I think every team meeting about the last three years has won one or two people. Spare voting forms with a ballot box if people want to vote manually. Okay. Okay, so the farm proposals now turn to these. Beef and Lamb has made their response to each remit, so we won't need to take time. So if we could just crack on with this. Farmer proposal one, the proposal of remit is Hamish Carswell. I'd now invite you to speak, Hamish. And if we, uh, Lindy, if you're just happy to start timing. Somebody will give you a microphone. Uh, the choice is yours. Yep. Yep, welcome. Mate. Welcome. Mate. Thank you, Andrew. I must say this is a, a bit um, daunting for a humble farmer from East Otago. I farm, farm there with my family. Um, um, Mr Chairman, the board, um, sorry. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and fellow farmers, both here and online. The following points deliver the reasoning behind my remit. Firstly, before I start, I would like to acknowledge and thank those farmers who contributed towards my expenses to be here, and also those that have messaged support. Now, um, it just shows that we, we are getting pretty good support for asking questions, and uh, I really appreciate that. The voter turnout is often poor, being around 20 to 30 per cent, so therefore larger em entities can have more um, influence. Particularly so if a high number of large entities vote the same way. It is my view that to allow a government-owned entity the ability to vote on government uh, influence direction is totally unfair on the rest of levy payers. Who agrees in this room that the plethora of government proposals, regulatory proposals, in the last years, three years, sorry, have been unfair, unworkable and unrelenting? Wow. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. It is unfair if they do vote. It simply gives the government far too much say. My thought is that a government-owned entity should not be able to vote in our organisation's decisions. They are always going to side with government direction. Why should the, the vote of one farming entity with many thousands of stock units, no matter who it is, not just PAMU, be more important and carry more weight slash influence than other farming operations that have lesser numbers of stock units. For example, the possible impact 
that foreign investors might have under a weighted vote system. Potentially, one foreign corporate entity could buy up numerous farms, equating to large stock unit accumulation in New Zealand, and so therefore could have more voting power than, say, 25 family farms, or even 50 family farms. That doesn't sit right at all. Why should large corporate dairy operations be able to potentially influence the outcome of a sheep and beef vote? One, they have their own industry body to vote with. To be fair, Dairy NZ has not exactly done sheep and beef farmers any favours of latter years. And even though they supply dairy beef, my view is that there is potential for their vote to influence, again, our organisation's decisions. I don't see that as being fair for our organisation, sheep and bevy, uh, sorry, sheep and beef farmer levy payers. Now, on that, um, another point that was raised by, uh, funny enough, I ended up sitting up, uh, sitting on the plane with Graham Evans yesterday, and he raised an interesting point, and it's something for us to all consider. Um, I think there's something like one million cows that have to be killed. And we, so we have the dairy beef herd that needs killed, but we also have our own uh, beef animals. Now, I guess many of us uh, are finding it tough to get animals away, no matter how far in front we uh, book space. And also with the bobby calf kill, that's influencing um, winter contract lamb kill. So there's a real industry discussion to have there, I believe. And, and uh, maybe Dairy NZ needs to front up a bit on that one too. Uh, yes, certainly it's to do commercially with the meat companies, but it's the in influence of Dairy NZ that's causing this. Lastly, most voting systems in New Zealand are one person, one vote. Just imagine, for example, if local body elections were on a weighted vote basis and the outcome could be manipulated by a handful of people that say own 50 to 60% of the property. And just as an example of that, I won't name him, but there's a person that has a lot, over 100 properties in Matara and Gore. On a weighted uh, vote basis, he would be pretty powerful in Matara and Gore. In concluding, I put forward that it is time Beef and Lamb as an organisation should consider a one farm, one voting system. Sheep and cattle can't vote, and they don't care. One person vote. Uh, sorry, one person, one vote defines democracy. To spend targeted time and energy on big players is an insult to the small players. Finally, this might well be a step towards bringing back some trust to an organisation in which a good degree of farmer trust needs restored. Thank you. Thanks, Hamish. Um, anyone else want to speak to this, Remit? Uh, gentleman at the back, oh, Steve. Kia ora, uh, Steve Tickner from uh, PAMU, uh, based in Wellington. Uh, my response is um, PAMU uh, is a standalone entity, a state owned enterprise. Uh, we uh, our success uh, is uh, the same. We succeed when you succeed. We fail when you fail. We, uh, are, uh, we report uh, to a, our own independent board and um, our outcomes are not designed uh, to uh, influence anybody at all. Um, we support uh, the weighted vote we pay a levy like everybody else on every, every animal we uh, supply, and uh, we are not there to disrupt the industry. We actually are very proud of the position that we take uh, within the industry. We put our uh, money where our mouth is. We support the industry. We support uh, collaborative, uh, collaborative uh, with uh, many research organisations and with uh, Beef and Lamb New Zealand, putting money in research and payment in kind back into the uh, industry in regard to uh, industry good. Uh, our, our, our business covers the whole country and we are concerned 
like you, around the success within the regions as well. So um, we, we, re we reserve uh, the right to uh, have uh, that say within the regions and at a national level. And um, I can assure you that we are not there to politicise agriculture. We are there for the, for the best interests of the region and for farming in general. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve, and thanks for coming today because it is highly appropriate that uh, as a government-owned entity that was, was, was talked about, that thank you for attending today and responding. I do appreciate that because, as I say, this is for the board to listen and consider what decision they would make after the fact. Any other um, people who would like to speak to this, Freeman? If not, um, mark your voting papers if you want to do it online and or uh, we will move on to the next one. Okay, am I in charge? Okay, Hamish, welcome to the stage. Uh, remit number two, and we will... Lindy, there's the clock going again because we've got the clock running here, but you're running a separate one, so thank you. Uh, good morning, all. Um, thank you to the chair and the board and everybody else here. It's uh, great to be up here in the North Island. Um... I, I must thank the board for already um, responding to this remit. So that was um, appreciated. Um, I, I struggled to understand why the names, uh, the contact details were actually taken off in the first place. Um, that something has to be questioned. Now, also, again, thank you to um, the supporters back in South Otago that... Um, have helped fund this trip for us as well. Now, fundamentally, what these remits are about is a loss of trust in beef and lamb and our board. And it has been clearly um, delivered in the Southern South Island elections, director elections, and also the 36% of farmer satisfaction is really poor. And if we carried on this way and dropping the next farmer levy vote would be very precarious. And so this, uh, it, from my point of view, is a very stern warning to your mandate on how you treat our sheep and beef farmers and their profitability and viability. Now just to put a bit of context from my background. Seven years ago, I learned about regenerative farming and I embarked on implementing those regenerative farming practices in a very fast and absolute way which caused some quite deep pain. Now, on one hand, on the graph that Greg McSkimming showed of the innovators at one end and the laggards at the other, of the irony is today I'm seen as both. I eat change for breakfast. That is my downfall. I love change and I welcome it and I go hard out to try and read the reality of this world, and although I know the reality of this world is quite deluded, the reality of my world is certainly not. Making a profit, raising a family, and building my ecosystem. Now, on one hand, we have increased soil carbon, we have planted out 8% of our farm last year in spaced poplars at an almighty cost. We have lowered our diesel use by something like 200%. And we have increased our profitability. So I would say I am on the leading edge, and I hate to brag, of change and accepting change and doing all that we can with my wife Amy 
to blaze a trail. But on the other hand, I am a laggard, seen and been called a laggard. I'm sitting by the greatest laggards in this room, Groundswell. There comes a point when regulation and taxing, etc., for no benefit, I will stand up. I have not got my head in the sand and I am no laggard. Uh, This day and age, we have as much information available to all of us as any expert in the world. I am not uninformed and neither are most of you guys. I want limited regulation, but any regulation that is put in place gets true outcomes. So in the past, this past year, we've spent $7,000 on a EOV land to market program where they actually come onto your farm and they independently measure soil, pastures, bird life, insect life, trees, water, carbon. The New Zealand Farm Assurance Program is just another big box ticking exercise. They have no idea what I actually do on my farm. I just look at outcomes, outcomes, outcomes. And then we also released, spent another $6,000 on releasing dung beetles for crying out loud. I mean, what a, where did I get that explosion from? But hey, if they bury the dung and fertilize my farming better and more efficiently while I sleep, I hope it works. But it may not work. But let me assure you, I've spent $13,000 voluntary. And I refuse to pay $4,000 taxed for the gross emissions. It's not off my farm. And so when it comes down to the fundamental consultation process of what was put out to all of us around Hiwaka Ekanoa, in my view or opinion, was an unmitigated disaster. You did not put out any consultation document beforehand. And may I ask, just to clarify, was that consultation document that was eventually put out, was it ready before the meetings or was it not? Any clarification? Somebody. Haywalker process was a really fluid process and as soon as the information came to light that we got comfort that we could take something out, we took it out. So a very, very complex, convoluted regime was put out to us And we had to sit in, sorry, I'll even go back a step. You agreed to the government to have these meetings at the beginning of a COVID outbreak that ended up being the biggest probably in our history. You put farmers' health at risk. I knew farmers that were not going to go because they could not afford to catch COVID because at the key harvest time of their season, they were dealing with people that needed to get things done. Bad move. Secondly, you medically discriminated against your own levy payers on who could and could not attend. Thirdly, you did Zoom meetings. You never do a Zoom meeting with such in-depth consultation. It was an insult to our intelligence. If James Shaw can tell us that he can't do a Zoom meeting and must attend the latest climate change conference in Egypt... I can't stand the hypocrisy. When we tried to have meetings about unasking questions, there was never enough time. And once we understood the fundamentals of the Hewaka Economic Process and the absolute um, impact on our profitability, I think that's part of Beef and Lamb's um, vision. So you hope you're going to take that out. I could not believe what I was seeing. So th- these three remits that I've put in, and just coming back to the Farmer Council, because 
I'll get on to that next, but I was on the Farmer Council for 13 years and three years as a chair, and I loved it, and I have utmost respect for our farmers on the Farmer Council. So please, this is not a dig or an attack at our Farmer Council. This is an attack at transparency and openness. You have lost our trust, and you can carry on pushing the way you're pushing, but just remember, in three years' time, there's another levy vote, and you do it at your peril. Thank you. Thank you, Hamish. Does anyone else want to speak to this rumour? I received some texts just for context. Oh, sorry, Christine. Um, I'm not going to speak to the remit um, per se, but can I just make a comment that to get through the remits um, as due process, that when the remit uh, submitters are speaking to their remits, we stick to the remit topic. Um, so that we can have the discussion. Um, like Hamish has got three remits to, to discuss and they cover all different things, so can we just yeah, stick to the topic for that 20 minutes allocated for that particular remit? Just it, to is, is the meeting comfortable with what Christine's proposed? There was, I'd received some text saying... Um, this narrative is not in relation to the remit and happy to let that run if that's the way people want to run it because it is your remit. Whoever takes a whole bunch of time talking doesn't give people either an opportunity to respond or support. So people can make what choice they want really what they do with their time. Okay, anyone else want to speak to this remit? As you will know, Beef and Lamb are quite supportive of this. Good question, Hamish. Why is the, the numbers not on there anyway? The only response I've got to that is some of the meat industry um, people over the years were busy people, and I oh, know I'm not not busy. They were didn't want to have their numbers there. But right, uh, farmer proposal three, Hamish Spelsky, would you like to speak to this? So now that I've set the scene, I'll be quick. <laughs> I remember discussing this topic about putting farmer council names and contact details up on the website, and um, back then we decided no, because we're all voluntary. And um, But sadly, because of the loss of trust, I believe you've lost that right to do that, and that's not, again, an attack on the farmer councillors, or don't take that personally. This is just a whole of beef and lamb um, to build back trust. Have your names, at least just your names, I think is a good compromise. So that, but I, I don't want, or just even your email, I don't want to have to ring the uh, extension manager and then get all these names and all these numbers. Um, I just want to go there. If it's too hard for me to make contact, I just won't. And that would be the, Many farmers, I would say, I may be wrong, have the same um, thoughts. So that's where I'll leave that. Thanks, Hamish. Anyone else would like to speak to this remit? David Nelson at the back. Uh, Hamish, just a point of clarification. Are you looking to amend that remit by saying their contact deals should, details shouldn't be on the website? Because you said you're comfortable with saying their names on the website. Could you clarify what you're after in that remit, please? Somebody got a microphone over here? Yep. I'd like all the details on the website, um, but like I say, it's just a discussion. And if you want to compromise, put your names there. I'm, I'm not technical or anything. I'm just trying to make a way through here. Sorry. Oh, yeah, David Nelson asked a question. Sorry. Just, yeah, sorry, we didn't pick up the name. That was my mistake. Okay, any other comments on this remit down the back? Uh, Jeff Martin, Northern Hi. North Island. Um, Hamish, as a compromise, I've been on the council for about 10 years myself, so 
Um, I'm the Deputy Chair of Northern North Island. I'm very welcome for anybody to ring me, to have my details up there. But we need to get more and younger members. It's a struggle to get members on the Farmer Council these days. And I think until they've had the professional development and the training pods down in Wellington that we send them to, this shouldn't occur. For the people that have been on the council for a longer time and they are equipped with uh, dealing with their communication, fine. And so it needs to be a voluntary thing and I think it should be once the farmer council members have been, had some training in this area. Any, uh, another responder here? Hamish Caswell? Um, I, I tried to get hold of my uh, local directors and I know this Farmer Council and directors, but I, I kind of view it the same way. Um, I tried to get hold of uh, Nikki Hislop's um, details off the website and was astounded that I couldn't find it. Now, so then I thought, hold on, I'd better check and see whether Ravensdown and Balance actually put theirs up. Balance have a generic email, Ravensdown didn't. So I rang Ravensdown and funnily enough, a week later they came back and apologised and said, we didn't realise. So um, I, I'm suggesting that even a, just a generic email um, will give us a point of contact. Thank you. At the yeah. back. Yeah, Andrew, uh, Paul Croak, National Farmer Council Chair. Just, just to, um, to further to what Jeff said, and I, and I know, look, Jeff, in, in the northern North Island, it, it can be hard to get members. We're in the eastern North Island. We've actually got a waiting list, so, um, which is great. But, Hamish, we, we discussed this the other day as a Farmer Council exec, and I think there's a general consensus amongst us that the chairs and the deputy chairs are in my role to have our details on the website, no problem. But we're probably a bit more mindful of farmer councillors per se. Uh, there's always the extension manager whose details are widely uh, known and easily findable. Um, so we, there's a point of contact that way as well. So, yeah. Okay, any other comments? If not, uh, you may tick your box if you've still got a vote, and we'll move on to the next room. Hamish, may I welcome you to the stage again? Um, so this is, um, from my point of view, the silence that was uh, coming from the Farmer Council. Um, I think if I was still on the Farmer Council, I would have been pretty, uh, would try to be vocal about the Haywaka Ikanoa. And, and so I was at the time reasonably um, frustrated with the Farmer Council and not um, standing up to more of the, the proposals of Haywaka Ikanoa. Anyway, I have since learned that a lot of the Farmer Councils did try and stand up. And so uh, thank you. Full credit to you, but were, um, I don't know, shut down and therefore uh, you weren't able to speak. So that's that's what I want somehow. it's it, To me, it's tricky. I, I understand that. I'm probably sending a message more than anything about how we can have that open and transparent discussion before these big proposals are... Um, put in front of us so that we have time to understand them and time to work through them. Um, and that that's all I have to say there. <clears throat> okay, anyone else like to speak to this remit? Can I clarify as a board, we never shut farmer councillors down from having an opinion? Can I make that statement and have that statement accepted? We, as a board, never shut farmer councillors down from having an opinion. Graham Evans. Yeah, Graham Evans, Southern South Island Chairman. He, um, you know I wouldn't be shut down by any bugger, Hamish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, have a, I'll have a fight. Um, yeah, it's not going to, it wouldn't happen. I had no idea. I'm a big fan of um, doing something positive about climate change and, and seeing where we really are. Um, hey, welcome to proposal. I was going to earn about, you know, I was just going to earn quite a bit of cash. So the loss of hey, welcome, I know, has cost me quite a bit of money on the business side. So it works both ways. Um, and that's all I've got to say. No one, no one, no one's going to shut me down. Not even the bully boys from Southland. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, Especially some... the bully boys from Southland. <laughs> yep. Rick over the side. Rick Burke. Yeah, Rick Burke. Um, I'm from the mid-northern area, farming in the Bay of Plenty. Yeah, I think uh, just a reference to what Hamish's um, remit um, is trying to address is a communication. And um, you won't shut um, uh, Graham down. I, I, I know what he was like when we did our uh, professional development together. So, so he's an exception. But uh, I think from my perspective, from our Mid-Northern Farmer Council's perspective, um, communication wasn't always both ways. Um, I know in my own experience, um, email is going to be for Lamb to Sam, yourself, Andrew, often weren't replied to. So, you know, this is a, this is a thing we're talking about, I, I think. And um, also, when you think about the Environment Reference Group, just recently, um, uh, management's trying to put some constraints around the Environment Reference Group as to... Um, keeping things inside the room um, as such. When grassroots farmers have some real concerns about what's going on, and grassroots farmers, a lot of them, have a lot more knowledge than, um, than uh, some of the, the direction we were being taken through beef and lamb. So that was our concerns, that we weren't being listened to. And I guess that's why a lot of us are in this room today. So in my, my point of view is, um, before anything else, communication is number one, and it should go both ways, and I think that's a bit that's been missing. Well, uh, sorry. Erica Van Ryn. Uh, kia ora, Erica Van Ryn and Morrison Farming today. Uh, egg first some other days. Um, I, I, Will and I were talking about this on the way up. Uh, most many of you in the room worked with us for a long time. I'm ex beef and lamb, uh, Will's ex farmer council chair, um, and we were talking about the good old days <laughs> when farmer council was created. I think um, to, uh, to to put a potential solution on the table for beef and lamb in relation to the discussion and discontent that that's in the room around this uh, these remits, three remits in particular is to think about the role of Farmer Council and the connectedness that that brings to our regions and the voice of the region coming back into the organisation. I think I've seen a, a bit more of a centralisation shift over the past few years uh, and possibly that that's, uh, that's what's, what we're seeing here in materialisation of that is that the, uh, the voice of the, the regions is not being heard by the organisation, the by farmers for farmers mantra was front and centre of everything we did, uh, and the, that was what the farmer council was created for. And I think and the the other groups off the farmer council. So, providing a bit more uh, empowerment back to the regions might be a, a possible solution for beef and lamb, uh, and for the farmers in the room to to be heard a bit better. Thank you. Any other um, people want to speak to this, Rima? Andrew, yeah. just, just one more point, a couple more points to add to that in terms of the Farmer Council. So we certainly hear what you're saying, and Rick, Graham is not the only exception because a lot of us do push back on a lot of this stuff, right? But we do it in the way, in the process, and the procedure, as, as I'm sure you're aware with your exposure to Farmer Council. So we've done some things differently over the last couple of years. What we've done in particular is that we've lined aligned the Farmer Council exec meetings with the board meetings. So we are specifically after time with the board so we can discuss this stuff and take from our regions back to the board and the management team around actually what's been going on and what we are seeing. Now, we can jump up and down, we can throw our hats on the ground, we can scream and shout and all that sort of stuff, and, and we do have some really hard conversations. Um, I talk to Andrew quite often, I talk to Sam and the management team, what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing. Now, ultimately, at the end of the day, that is the board makes a decision. So we take the information up, and the board and the management team are making those decisions, given all the other complexities that are involved. But the clear message that I've got for people today is that the Farmer Council is not some sort of lapdog. We get in there, and, and we push our case for our regions, because we're very protective, very mindful of what's going on, and we care deeply about the farmers and the levy powers that we represent. So we're not just there for the cup of tea and the sausage roll, we actually go in there, 
we've lifted the level and we, we make these guys accountable for what they're doing and give that feedback. Agree, the comms could be better. We've argued a lot and talked a lot about the two-way communication and how we get that back. We feed into a lot of things and it's about getting that feedback back and as what's changed. So I just want to be really clear that the Farmer Council is fighting really hard for farmers in our regions, for the levy payers throughout the country. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Paul. Any other comments on this remit? Can I give some context around the terms of reference for specific groups? We can choose, we, we put that to Farmer Council and the Farmer Council can choose whether they want to support it or not. We have to have the ability to release confidential information to our, those specific groups if we want the best feedback. If, like any board, if we don't have any confidences around where that information may end up, that, that highly exposes us. To get the best outcome, we want to share the most information we can with those reference groups. If Farmer Council don't support a terms of reference, there'll be a situation where some of that information couldn't be shared in confidence. It's really about as simple as that. Any more in relation to this remit? Okay, we're trucking along uh, well. And <laughs> Okay, <laughs> Christine? Um, could I just add to those uh, discussion points that the, the Farmer Council aren't directors and we're not baby directors or directors in training. Um, so it's more of a consultative body for the, for the organisation. So we sort of sit out the side and bark quite loudly at times. Um, but we're not, uh, we're representing our farming communities in our regions, and, but we're not responsible for the direction of the organisation as such. That's the board and the management. And we take those messages back both ways um, within our regions. So, so, the liability of the Farmer Council members, um, I think some people hold Farmer Council members in, in high expectation, um, but our, the bulk of our Farmer Council are good everyday community people, farmers that um, are being involved for their regions, and so they shouldn't have that responsibility of trying to be a director or having those responsibilities. Just, just a point. Thank you, Christine. Hamish, Belsky. Um, no, sorry. Hopefully I've not come across like that at all. I do not have those high expectations on our farmer councillors. Um, being one, um, it's in a very important role, but ultimately the buck stops at the board. And all we ask for is communication, clear communication, and plenty of it. Because in this last three years, discussion is a very rare word. Thanks, Hamish. And that's why we split the chairman and CEO report. I want the board to take responsibility for the uh, advocacy positions we've taken. And I want you guys to give us clear feedback if you're not comfortable with us. That's why we specifically did that. Um, you're quite right, Christine. Thank you for bringing that up. I don't want the responsibility landed on a farmer council. I want the responsibility landed back on the board. Any more comments in relation to uh, this remit? Okay, we are tracking along well ahead of time. Okay, can we move to uh, farmer proposal number five? Graham Gleeson, can I welcome you to the stage, please? <laughs> Kia ora, Graeme Gleeson from the Waikato. So this remit is centred upon the importance to engage with farmers, to have a conversation by using best practice consultation. We did not see this in recent years. 
Consultation with farmers is hugely important as it provides an opportunity to have an open forum, to have a timely conversation, for a multitude of good reasons to inform, to, un to unite, to seek feedback and guidance, to empower and to solicit a mandate. The process of how a consultation is managed will inevitably need to have a different format that will differ depending upon whether the consultation is about policy created externally by government in comparison to policy that has been internally designed by industry. And for reference, you can think of essential fresh water, a government designed policy versus Hiwaka Kanoa. So the internally designed by industry policy, this requires careful consideration to ensure process will be undertaken with integrity, honesty, open transparency with full disclosure of all pertinent information. For consultation about internally designed policy, it becomes complicated due to the likelihood of some vested self-interest in presenting one's own policy with risk that the conversation will likely to be steered towards pre-selected outcomes with the desire to gain a strong mandate to accept broadly that policy. This sets up a conundrum of top-down we know best rather than foster a lead from the middle, harnessing value feedback about how to do better, thus getting strong buy-in and support. So what could best practice consultation look like? There is no blueprint that will satisfy all circumstances, but there will surely be key principles that support a framework to assist and provide guidance. Best practice consultation reflects leadership that upholds, supports and seeks the importance of having an open, participative, transparent and valued conversation that will give rise to a joint collaborative problem solving approach. Best practice consultation ensures every farmer has a valued, equally fair opportunity to participate in the conversation, and I need to emphasise that, and decision making process. There must be acceptance that there may be disagreement, and this cannot be belittled or pushed aside. Best practice consultation recognises that there is a broad church of farmers, hence information to support a conversation must be delivered that is firstly simple to comprehend, ensuring inclusiveness of all farmers, yet also broad in depth for those who crave the detail. Best practice consultation will ensure better that farmers are well informed to make decisions. As a follow on, best practice consultation will enable better surety that farmers can ultimately provide and support a mandate that is without refute or mutinous challenge. Best practice consultation will lead with guidance but not steer the conversation with a hidden agenda as to what success looks like. Information that is presented must be balanced and veritable without skewed distortion. Best practice consultation allows farmers to directly assess whether the sector leaders and advocates are on the job, are trustworthy, are passionately serving farmers with honesty, integrity, having their back. It allows farmers to assess whether leaders and advocates are truly well versed and up to date about the subject. Best practice consultation allows farmers to become better informed and have confidence that the subject material being discussed is not just a top-down bureaucratic directive about what is going to happen polished up by some heavy-handed spin doctoring. Best practice consultation allows and values feedback at all stages, stages and this must be forthcoming. Best practice consultation is not a juggernaut on the autobahn intent to get to the end destination, but not concerned about unintended consequences. Farmers are expecting and have preference for a two-way conversation with options to suggest that the conversation must either slow up, turn left, turn right, to reverse back or perhaps do a U-turn, or if everything becomes dire, to pull over and stop. Time to take a cup of tea. Best practice consultation will recognise every conversation is dynamic and that there will be changes 
modification and interplay in the search for consensus and or mutual agreement. Best practice consultation ensures that the conversation cannot be hemmed into a rut to be railroaded down a single pathway with the excuse highlighting the scope of decision making is tightly and narrowly framed, which is unbudgeable. There should always be opportunity to flip the conversation to identify alternative options that can assist, solve and head off what would be a poor, disastrous outcome. Best practice consultation is premised upon the timely available of pertinent and necessary information, so not delivered late or after the consultation has concluded, which will then allow positions to be anchored with a high degree of confidence that they are well placed. The anchoring of positions will often require deep understanding of subject material with no stone left unturned, with all information deeply mined to garner insight and knowledge particularly with highly related and pertinent about sheep and beef farming, but also knowing what the other parties are anchoring their positions onto. The donkey work of developing positions will often require testing of assumptions and likely impacts that can only be learned by analysing many what-if scenarios which demand using modelling decision support tools. Confidence in outcomes can only be had if the models are populated by background information of good accuracy and are relatively complete. It is imperative that modelling work must be undertaken as early as possible and as new information comes to hand that soon afterwards everything is updated. If modelling work indicates the expected outcomes may become unpalatable, then this cannot be hidden and ignored. Anchored positions must always be reassessed and reframed, if necessary, to avoid poor outcomes. Best practice consultation will utilise many different platforms of engagement to deliver the opportunity to have a conversation with farmers. Above all else, it is well known most farmers will generally prefer face-to-face -face meetings, as these are considered more meaningful and personable, having ability for everybody to see each other eye to eye. So in conclusion, best practice consultation cannot be undertaken with a lot, without a lot of advanced preparation using a framework to ensure it is fully readied and fit for purpose, to enable a meaningful, valued conversation. A consultation engagement plan must therefore be developed, yet accommodating of flexibility to deliver a variety of different types of information, and in return, to gain us as farmers support to advance a mandate to proceed or not. So thank you. Do you want me to wait here? Okay. Um, any speakers to the remit? Graham, look, you made some really pertinent points there around, you know, government construct of legislation versus working on the first time we've ever worked on government with something like this poses new and significant challenges. So I think it's appropriate that you've challenged us on this. You know, we have never had to do this before. So that's appropriate. Um, the cho Oh, yep, yeah, sorry, Phil. I'll just, sorry, finish up. The other thing I'll respond to is... Um, Sometimes the option to slow down, pull back, is not within our time frame. Our then choice is to exit, and we have always said we will exit if we don't get a deal that's appropriate. Phil. Hi, Phil. We're uh, mid-northern North Island on the Farmer Council Chair there in Farm in Te Pahu. Um, Graham, thanks for the um, information on best practice consultation. I guess a question for the audience and for yourself is how do we do that? Uh, in an environment where politically there's time frames placed on, on those consultative processes that may restrict all information being available for detailed modelling. How do we operate when there will be inherent uncertainty but we're needing to work to some form of outcome with some uh, legislative backstops around Hiwaka, for, for instance? Can, do you, is that a rhetorical question? Uh, it might be. <laughs> <laughs> Look, having a conversation with farmers is critically important. And look, this is a new lead for us with an industry mm. design policy. 
So we really should have been thinking about you know, a framework of how to deliver that consultation. I think we just sort of walked into it and uh, tried to run it, you know, seat of a pants style. So that's obviously, you know, looking back now in hindsight, not good enough. So going forward, you know, we need to think deeply about how we're going to engage with farmers. We're going to see perhaps more and more of the style of uh, policy being created. And so if we don't sort of get ahead of it, we're going to be mired in the same problems that we have today. Okay, any other comments to this remit? Hamish, Belsky? Um, it's all very well for the government to lower speed limits so we don't crash. And if the government keeps forcing through things like this at pace, this is what happens, you crash. You, you can't make an excuse that they pushed you because then you crash and then you're responsible. So think very deeply about that, that what is pressured upon us, you have to learn to say no. Graham Evans? <laughs> this consultation is a bit like me and my mother. Uh, my mother trying to get me to eat tripe. Um, you know... It was a long conversation over many years. But early on, she had all the, all the, all the, all the, all the sort of, all the, couldn't, couldn't stay up, stand out, you know, or on my own mind, hit me around the, clip me around the ear. And so we had this tripe, and it's like swallowing a dead rat, and this is what the government's done to us. We've got to swallow this dead rat, um, or tripe. I think dead rat could be better than tripe. And <laughs> as I grew, old, I grew older, I just... You know, the, the, the threats were less and less, and in the end I just gave up eating tripe when I didn't eat till the following morning. So we're going to have to, at some point, um, realise that sometimes in our lives we're going to have to do things we don't want to do. You can have all the consultation you like, and you can feel really good about it, but sometimes somebody is going to make you do something you don't want to have to do. Any other speakers to this, Raymond? Hamish Caswell. This remit is at the heart of uh, the lack of trust in, uh, by farmers in the board. Now, this is not everyone. I'm sure there are some supporters. And this is not a reflection of the Farmer Council at all. I think uh, certainly most people I've talked to that are impassioned about this, and, and this is great for the industry to have the, um, the conversation, Directors, you're accountable here. You needed to have um, beat the pavement, so to speak, not leave it up to the Farmer Council. You needed to get out and talk to, not your buddies, go and talk to the real grassroots farmers and make it quite a number of them. And that's the whole thing. Um, comments from one previous Farmer Council, which many of you may know, Mark Zeno, total lack of engagement. And he's an influencer in his district. He, he didn't expect to be rung, but why weren't you talking to people like him and other grassroots farmers? The, that's where the discontent's from. OK, I'm going to challenge you, Hamish. Have you read Beef and Lamb's response to how we tried to provision engagement? Have you read that? Um, a, a, a brief look, Andrew, <laughs> yeah, but sure. But this is yeah, what okay. I'm saying is that you have... It, it's, this is what... Um, the, the best thing that's happened today is the online viewing because people are getting to see the conversation and, and they can't always ask it, and, and it's great. Yep, so look, thank you. We have worked our hardest to engage with our community under unbelievable constraints in relation to time and COVID. I will leave our response there. Rick, Burke? Yes, Rick Burke again. Um, yeah, I think part of what Graham's saying is um, the due dil diligence that needed to be done by Beef and Lamb. This was moving really fast. You've just talked about that, Andrew. We know how quickly it's moving. Um, but I think we can all learn that um, we needed to do a lot more homework than we did, and we've made some mistakes. And um, I think that um, we can blame COVID. You know, that's the reason to a degree, but um, I think if we're looking at Team Ag, 
or even just beef and lamb on its own, should have been able to say, no, nah, this, is, this is crazy, it's too fast, let's pull on the handbrake. And I think we're, the, we're too soft on the government. Um, we should have ripped into them and said, no, this is just too, too tough, we need to get our numbers right, we need to, need to do, a, do diligent properly, and we've got to ensure, and we sh should have been ensuring the, um, or foreseen the unintended impact um, all this was going to have on extensive sheep and bee farmers. And, it, and it's, it hasn't landed well for our extensive sheep and bee farmers um, in terms of what's being proposed in Hiwaki Kanaa. So I'm just saying that what Hamish has just talked about, what Graham talked about, we should be strong enough to, to pull on the handbrake and say, no, have we got this right? Um, and we weren't. Thanks for that view, Rick. Any Thank other you. comments? If not, um, we are well ahead of time, so I've just got a text that we can break for lunch at 12.15, so we want to have a break now. How long is lunch for fee? And what? Uh, so we'll come back to the room at 1 o'clock. Are you, the, uh, the room happy with that if we break now and come back in at 1 o'clock? Yep, excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we are now on to, we're just starting after uh, the lunch break on your agenda there for farmer, sorry for farmer, farmer proposal number six. Jane, if you'd like to come to the stage and potential remit, thank you. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, MC. And thank you for all being here today and to those online. I will take my remit and the rationale and the response as read. I think it's going to be up on the, on the screen shortly. So this is remit six. Now, can I be clear that the reason why I'm here today is because I am very passionate about beef and lamb and the role that beef and lamb plays in our industry. But I'm also very concerned about its future. Today I'm going to cover off within my 20 minutes, Lindy, um, number one, the reasons why an independent review is absolutely essential, um, the scope that the said review um, could, could be around, and also number three, the consequences if, if we don't carry out such a function. Beef and Lamb's advocacy pathway needs to be independently scrutinised with a line of sight to rebuilding trust and clarity in the positions that Beef and Lamb will take in future negotiations with the government on behalf of their levy payers. Can I note not only the unprecedented number of farmer proposals here today, but all related to advocacy, but also reference, and it was referenced earlier today, the most recent Beef and Lamb Farmer Engagement Survey, and well done to Beef and Lamb for continuing to do those surveys, that ranked farmer satisfaction um, with Beef and Lamb at its lowest ever, I believe, at 36%. It should concern everyone in the room today that Beef and Lamb are potentially at a similar crossroads with their levy payers as meat and wool was when the wool levy was, vote, uh, was lost 14 years ago. I think my maths is right on that, 2009. Due to potentially insufficient and ineffective levy payer rapport, empathy and communication with grassroots farmers. Following this, uh, and I, I saw this from my own, you know, own, own eyes um, as, a, as a new farmer to our area down in Otago, all beef and lamb directors literally got in their car and took to the road in a major way, um, holding circa 20 to 30 farmer meetings each winter and genuinely engaging with farmers um, rather than you know, potentially retreating to the boardroom with the door firmly closed. Can I be clear, the risk, and this has come up earlier today too, I, I see with interest, um, the risk of losing the entire levy in three years' time is a very real one, and one that honestly keeps me awake at night, hence the, the need for a review of current priorities. And thank you to Graham Gleeson for earlier sharing uh, the best practice consultation, the key to best practice consultation. Now is a crucial time for both the board and levy payers to evaluate what by farmers, for farmers, really means in 2023, and how Beef and Lamb can once again demonstrate this, both in principle and practice, as they did a decade ago. And I really believe that Beef and Lamb can. 
Can I take this opportunity to rebut the beef and lamb response to remit six that incorrectly suggested that that um, during a review that no correspondence would occur with director, staff or farmer council for the said review. This is factually incorrect as the remit does not propose that no interaction takes place of course, but clearly proposes that no further correspondence or undue influence by the Beef and Lamb Board, Farmer Council members or management occurs and that, that is simply standard practice for any independent review. The review would also consider both the perceived and tangible tension between Beef and Lamb accepting and utilising Crown funds for specific extension and research projects whilst at the same time attempting to engage in real advocacy. Now I know that was noted by you before Mr Chair and um, again I, I appreciate putting that on the table but you know negotiations around that same table when you've also received money from the Crown it's a bit like running with the hares and hunting with the hounds and it's never been an effective negotiation strategy, regardless of whatever world we're, we're in. This review would also include an assessment on the rationale of the current research and development that Beef and Lamb is engaging in, of which most of it is extremely, extremely good for farmers. However, there are certain parts of that that endorse a predetermined view of the politics overriding science at time. Can I give you an example? And that would be some of the implications involved with the methane research, methane reduction research, in terms of really focusing our breeding of our sheep, which we have you know, decreased emissions by 30% since 1990. That is highly concerning um, in terms of the, the pathway that we might be going down that could be detrimental to production. The review would also include an assessment on beef and lamb's capability and willingness to delineate sheep and beef advocacy from dairy advocacy when and where required. Um, I understand that that will be covered in remit nine, so I won't go too much more into that. Cost. It was certainly disappointing to see beef and lamb's response to this remit that the cost of a review would be prohibitive to a genuine, genuine independent review occurring. Now I'm of uh, Scottish and German descent, so um, I, you know, reasonably uh, have a reasonable amount of gorse in my pocket. But you know, a cost of a of a decent review would be minuscule compared to the intolerable fallout costs associated with some certain advocacy activities, such as the development of the Haywalker Economic Partnership. So that's not the cost of actually doing it; it's a, it's the cost of the implications. Now, can I just run you through some of those numbers? 248 million of methane taxes, the potential loss of over 2,300 sheep and beef farming families, along with 16 million stock units plus. So all of these consequences have, haven't been simply caused by um, advocacy, but they've been escalated by some misguided and misjudged advocacy decisions, including the rush of, the, the, um, of Haywaka Ikenaua. So where our sector has literally jumped on the methane bus even before question, questioning where it was going and what the real cost of the fear would be. This is really concerning and I know I totally understand your point earlier, Sam, then you said that carbon farming is ripping the heart out of, um, potentially ripping the heart out of our communities, but methane taxes will expedite this. And... Uh, one area that I've been really um, delighted to see Beef and Lamb engaging in has been the Hill Country Futures Programme, but there may not be any future for Hill Country um, if we continue on the same trajectory in terms of the proposal where it is. So this is just one case study that could be covered during the review to assess the key tenants of Beef and Lamb's advocacy and the involvement in the, and we've heard today about the um, the, the, the communication and the, the very strange, I guess, definition of, of um, consultation that happened during that process. And it's also been mentioned today that, that when the, the real implica implications of such a uh, policy were only defined and, and um, put out to farmers following the consultation meetings. One area that I would also love to see, and I've had a lot of farmers say this as well, is to see the Meat Industry Association really step up and, and actually enter into that political fray. Um, we're up against the Dairy Companies Association, uh, Fonterra, other dairy companies, they totally get in there, boots and all. So we should be too, and I'd really like to see MIA um, do less subcontracting of their responsibility to beef and lamb and more helping beef and lamb alongside that. I'd really, really like to see that. For the board to simply respond in, 
an internal desktop review via the Pharma Council would suffice in this review um, is, you know, is, is, is potentially negligent. And I quote, um, just looking at two key policy issues that could have been done better. And that will not suffice for a review. The key issue of advocacy is an issue that potentially has cost Beef and Lamb New Zealand with respect their chairman this, this past week and could cost the organisation the future of their compulsory levy. I urge the board to take this very seriously. A review would not simply be an advocacy autopsy, but an opportunity to step up. Can I ask when considering the, the review findings that Beef and Lamb needs to decide is it 100% in advocacy or is it out? I'm not suggesting it should be you know, out of advocacy, but the pick and choose mentality that we've seen over the last um, two years, and I've seen it for, my, for myself, is really hard to reconcile. So when certain policy issues such as property rights, such as biodiversity, tenure review, SNAs and cultural areas are left, left to the lesser funded federated farmers, whom have done their very best in this area, while beef and lamb tends to take the, the closer to the government sort of glory regulations such as generic methane taxation, has been of concern. I think it's about sharing the low, but I think it's also very concerning that from the government's view, this can create confusion, distortion and lack of transparency about who they're actually going to to get what does agriculture think of this. And given that with the previous Prime Minister that we heard multiple times that she's spoken to agriculture on this. Now, when very often when she mentioned that, she was talking about the Food and Fibre Leaders Group that she'd had a, a sideways conversation with or a, a formal presentation from. So why do we have all these layers of advocacy if, that, if a sideways conversation with the PM through the Food and Fibre Leaders Group is all that it takes? You know, That is really concerning because that could totally trump any good work that is being done depending on the position that's taken. So on behalf of farmers I represent today, and I thank all the farmers um, from all over New Zealand that is, have asked me to come today and supported me in being here, we ask the directors to not default to the defensive position of circling the wagons, but to use the pathway of an independent review to reflect, acknowledge and assess advocacy decisions and positions that they have been privy to on our behalf, particularly over the past two years. We ask you to start again alongside all of your farmers to leave behind that defensiveness and be there with an open mind, an open door and a clear line of sight to what representing grassroots farmer sentiment really looks like. This review needs to be carried out by a genuinely independent body and be reasonable in cost, as I suggested before, not prohibited to a desktop exercise with the full and final findings, including transcripts of um, feedback presented in a transparent way to all levy payers. Given the wave, and this is a key point, given the wave of the further pending regulations, and Andrew acknowledged that before, you know, we're, we're, they're actually coming at us and very fast, and some big regulations, including uh, property rights and fresh water, may even, uh, I guess, surpass uh, methane taxation in terms of size and implications and for land use change. So again, thank you for this opportunity and I just again want to stress the risk of losing our levy organisation is here and it's real. And also the risk of, of the future of our entire sheep and beef sector, a sector that we're all passionate about and that's why we're in the room to, this room today. So thank you for the opportunity and I look very much forward to the review and its findings. Thank you. Okay, um, our live stream guys, just got the message that the video had frozen, but the sound's working. Is that all right? Yep, cool. Uh, anyone else want to speak to this, Rima? Point, point of clarification to Sam McIver. Um, so, Jane, you, uh, you noted that Beef and Lamb New Zealand wasn't involved in biodiversity at all and left fed farmers to it. In fact, we requested to be in the room with government uh, to discuss biodiversity. We were locked out of the room and Fed Farmers was the representative uh, for the industry in there. So the first that we got of biodiversity was when the NPS uh, was released, and we've absolutely opposed it very clearly uh, from that day. So I just need to clarify that. Nils, now, hey, just so those listening on live stream, we're going to do this remit, then we're going to shut down for three minutes while they reset, and they'll get the video back on. But we'll continue with this remit, and we'll do the shutdown and the break. 
Is that okay, guys? Yep, cool. Um, Nels. Okay, um, Nels Hansen, Taranaki. I just wanted to say that I think um, one thing that is being exposed to is, in general, farmers are, uh, it's a two-way street, and farmers have to take responsibility for actually reading stuff and getting to meetings and turning up. And um, I, I thought today some of the stuff that Van Gellis spoke of, he actually uh, reinforced the need for some of the stuff. I mean, I'm an anti-vaxxer and I'm anti-climate change. <laughs> That's my position. That's my personal view. But I can see there's more and more relevance to actually having to actually engage with some of the stuff and actually feel like you're going to have to participate. And I think that we have to temper... I, I can see there's almost grief in your... In you, there's grief, there's genuine grief amongst our community. But we also have to balance that with some pragmatic responsibility on our behalf that we have let ourselves down in the last three years by actually not being out more like we... Like when Grantsville was out, that was a huge engagement by our community. We're severely lacking in both feeds and beef and lamb for farmers to turn up unless they're pissed off. Any other speakers to the remit? Laurie, Patterson. Yeah, I think just uh, taking on board what Sam said about the biodiversity thing and, um, you know, them being locked out of the room. Uh, of course, the other one goes back to the NPS on fresh water when Federated Farmers were locked out of the room. And at that time, in my opinion, uh, Beef and Lamb and, De and Dairy NZ should have said, if they're locked out, we're out too because that's the only way, I think, to deal with these people. And then Sam's telling us the reverse happened the other time. So we've got to get this advocacy thing together. Thanks, Laurie. Any other comments? Um, just in relation to having farming meetings, I, don't, I can't remember if it was this remit or one. I, we, uh, we did a lot of engagement. I had a really favourable meeting in Mossburn where one guy turned up. And so quite often we can take a horse to water, but we can't make them drink. He got a lot of personal attention at that meeting. It was good. <laughs> Any other uh, speakers to the REMA? How much time we got, Lindy? Two minutes. Oh, five. Oh, five. Okay. Um, Jane, referencing the glory legislation that we... We, we don't pick which stuff we've done. This this methane stuff has hardly been a glory space for us to be playing just quietly. It's cost us immense time and effort, resources. Look, we would love to not be spending all this time on advocacy. Our farmers have asked us to advocate and our farmers have asked us to work with sector organisations so that we're not throwing our mates under the bus and we're coming along with a line position. I think it would be interesting to consider as we ask for a review. We, you know, if you want to be, if we want to be comprehensive, we'd have to ask for a whole of industry review how all the different organisations come up with their positions. That is a separate review to whether one one entity should be representing. Those are different questions. Okay. If no more speakers want to speak to this remit. Thank you very much. You can vote your papers if you still need to. Okay, can we move to farmer proposal number seven? This is from Jason Barrier. Jason? Uh, for those of you that don't know me, which I imagine will be most of you, um, I'm Jason Barrier. I'm a hill country farmer. I farm uh, Wairinga in the North Waikato and in Matawai uh, above Gisborne. George Orwell once said, if liberty means anything, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. And so I've come here today to say some things that some of you will not want to hear. That, in my opinion, he Wakarekanoa has failed our industry and that it is leading us to a place where pine trees will soon bury our farms and our homes. I want it known from the outset that I'm just a farmer. Unlike many of you, I have no pedigree within beef and lamb here. No political axe to grind and no personal animosity to any board member here today. And I want to acknowledge 
the amazing work that beef and lamb staff do in many other areas, such as some of the work we heard from this morning, from Dan and others. Indeed, had he Wakarika Noah produced a plan where farmers like me would be taxed appropriately for our additional warming footprint and where we would be rewarded for our overall cooling footprint and one where we could walk side by side with other farmers and other countries and make a meaningful contribution to reducing additional warming, then I would not be here today. I'd be out in the hills with my dogs because that would be a plan that we could all surely agree with. But here I am, because regrettably, Iwaka Ekanoa has produced no such plan. Instead, it has produced a set of recommendations that ask New Zealand sheep and beef farmers to carry a heavier burden than many other sectors. A plan that asks New Zealand farmers to put our heads into the noose of methane taxation while our friends in the United States and Brazil watch on. It's a plan of infinity taxes where no matter how hard we try, we will still be taxed and so will our children. And it is a plan where the only thing standing between us and financial hardship in the medium term is this fuzzy concept that somehow, in some way, the old Wellington nudge, nudge, wink, wink brigade are going to be able to pull an iron out of the fire and are going to be able to convince every bureaucrat and every politician and every government of every hue and every colour and beg them not to increase the price of methane. That, ladies and gentlemen, is not a plan. That is a pipe dream. This trust us, we've got this self-confidence that emanates from our leadership. Well, let me tell you, you've got nothing at this point. Nothing except a castle made of sand because your own figures, our own beef and lamb impact modelling figures show. And the government's numbers concurred. And even the ex-Prime Minister understood that when the methane prices start to rise. 30% of us North Island hill country boys will be out of a job. So how did we get here? How did we get to a place where we are even discussing an agreement that contains a huge risk to a very significant part of our industry? I blame no single person in this room because no single sheep and beef farmer could have come up with such a ludicrous plan from the outset. Instead, I blame the much vaunted team ag approach taken by Hiwaka Rekanoa, where the yoke of our partnerships and the quicksands of compromise have led us into places where belonging became confused with outcomes where we took one for the team one too many times. Now, I know there are a great mob of apologists and defenders in New Zealand for He Waka Rekanawa, and there may even be one or two of you in the room here today. But when you run them through the drafting race of reason, you are left with three distinct smaller mobs. The first mob are those who... who cling to this illusion that because we're all in the tent together, then somehow we must have gotten a better deal. Well, those two points do not necessarily join up. Indeed, the history of our sector is littered with examples to the contrary. Ask Kirsten Bryant how much support she got from Team Ag and the Land and Water Forum. Ask Graham Gleeson over there what happened at the Huntley meeting where our team ag advocate, an ex-dairy farmer, came along and told a group of us sheep and beef farmers that plan change one was a good outcome, but he was sorry that some of us wouldn't make it through. Ask Kim Robinson, who wanted to be here today, 
Her concessions to Team Ag are undermining agreed sheep and beef positions in the Environment Court as we speak. And ask me about a meeting in Karapiro where a well-known dairy lobbyist came up to me at the meeting and told me that we needed to have a conversation about honourable exits for hill country farmers like me. Now that's not my idea of a team. It might be yours, it's not mine. And uh, the way I look at it, you know, being in bed with the dairy industry, and I choose those words carefully because that is a different animal, the dairy industry, to our dairy farming neighbours and friends. Being in bed with the dairy industry is a bit like dating a rhinoceros. It might be all very amicable at the outset, but you know when the candle burns low and it's time to go home, you just know who's going to be left with the bill. Us, the sheep and beef farmers. It's happened before and it's happening again. And still we cling to this illusion like motherless pups. So I challenge all of you who are still searching for this holy grail of Team Ag, have a look at the results, have a look at the outcomes and ask yourselves, what good is it for us to be in the tent if we have to sell the very shirts off our backs to stay in there? The second mob of defenders after the drafting race are those who run around bleating platitudes today, like we've all got to do our bit. I get that. And so do most New Zealand farmers. But doing my bit also includes paying my mortgage. It includes being part of a growing export industry, not a shrinking one. And it includes being part of a vibrant rural community, not a hollowed out one. And it sure as hell doesn't include offsetting other parts of New Zealand or our overseas competitors. Let them do their own bits. And the last and most dismal mob after the drafting gates, the tail enders, if you like, which I believe was about 70% of the uh, beef and lamb rebuttal of this remit, are those who trot out this lame, defeatist claptrap, which is like my mother's reheated lentil and cabbage soup. It gets worse with every serving. <laughs> that, oh, well, it's not ideal, but at least it's better than the ETS. Is that the best we can hope for? Where are the aspirational voices for this industry that has so much to offer in terms of land-based climate change solutions? Where is the public acknowledgement and government acknowledgement that every New Zealand lamb eaten overseas is a good thing because of our relative carbon footprints? But no, instead of shouting those things from the rooftops, we concede and we shrink into the dark corners of defeat, blaming the government, blaming the ETS, blaming legislation. Well, I'm sorry, but I expect more from our leadership than that, because you know that any bit of legislation can be changed. It takes 62 seats in the House. And you also know that all governments pass, even this one. And you also know that on a journey of 30 years, there is almost always more than one pathway forward. This idea that it's your way or the highway, HWIN or the ETS has to stop. To those of you who will seek to misconstrue these words as a call to division and factionalism, well, I say you are wrong. This is not about isolating ourselves. This is about independence. Sometimes, the interests of intensive dairying and the interests of our industry will align. But often they will not, and we need leadership that understands that difference. And to those of you who come here today seeking to unite this industry, well, I'm with you. This is your time, this is your chance, and what better chance than to exit from the squalid business of Hiwaka Rekanoa and rewrite an emissions plan that is by our industry, for our industry.
a plan that works for all of us, not just those in the front rows of this industry, the old established families and the environmental leaders, but one that works for the small farmers, the young farmers, the indebted farmers, and those of us in the back rows of this industry. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we are left in the end with only one question to answer here today. Do we continue to trudge down this path of appeasement and compromise and the shackles of Hiwaka Rekanoa? Or do we stand our ground and fight with a stronger and more independent voice? This farmer and many others across the country would prefer the latter option. And so we call upon this board to stand aside from the beekeepers, the dairy farmers, and all of your other Hiwaka Rekanoa partners, so that you may stand up and fight for our industry, for our future, for our children's future. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, any, what do you want to say uh, in relation to this remit? Yes, gentlemen down the front. Uh, John Carrad, sheep and beef farmer north of Wellington, not far from where most of our problems come from. <laughs> uh, I can assure you uh, that won't influence what I've got to say. I've got a question for the board as to the working part of He Walker Ekanoa the greenhouse gas calculator designed to calculate the liability for the farmers who will then be expected to pay it. That's what it does. Now here's what it can't do. It can't at the same time tell a farmer what effect their farm is having on climate. Did you know that? So the question was, the beef and lamb calculator cannot tell what a farmer impact is having on the environment. Was that the question? On the climate. Yeah. Okay, well, my response to that would be um, there is known impact of methane on the environment and there's known impact of nitrous oxide. There's, there is greenhouse gases and they are measurable. We then have to work out what our role, our role is when we, if you can't know your numbers, you can't manage your numbers. You may not be a problem, but how do you know if you can't manage it, if you can't measure it? That is what a greenhouse gas calculator does. We can measure our contribution of methane, we can measure our contribution of nitrous oxide, and we can measure our sequestrations. And we could demonstrate whether we are part of the problem a big part of the problem, a little part of the problem, no part of the problem. Positive contribution to the issue. Yes, that's two effects on climate. Climate's complicated. If you'd gone to the trouble of talking to climate scientists, they would have told you that that calculation is missing a number of effects on climate. I think where the confusion has come from is the... Uh, UN counting rules that uh, signatories like New Zealand uh, are required to account for in the national inventory. It just has those two parts. But you've got to remember these rules, what uh, James Shaw calls the rule book, was written by politicians at the UN, not climate scientists. So I repeat, the climate is much more complex than that. And the other effects on climate that agriculture has uh, tends to favour uh, uh, pastoral farming over forestry. It has a high albedo, high soil carbon. It does not produce a number of uh, compounds that uh, lengthen the life of methane and produces a large number of what are called gas phase precursors to aerosols. Aerosols make the climate work. They're vitally important. None of this, of course, was included in the uh, accounting rules that came out of the UN. It wasn't seen as necessary. 
So I guess what I'm saying is that you've got, um, as far as uh, farmers are concerned, they, they're being accounted for one side of the ledger, but the other side's completely missing. And I just wanted to know how much you, the board, as she knows about the science itself. Yeah. Now, is this a statement, a question? You've asked us how much we know. We have workshopped this significantly with international climate scientists. You will find international climate scientists from here to here. Whilst we have workshops so we get an understanding of what do we enact within the legislation that sits in front of us, which is Climate Change Response Act targets, which are domestic targets irrespective of NDCs, etc. Can we move on as opposed to this is a conversation around uh, whether people were involved in Haywaka Kanoa as opposed to a climate change conversation? Yes, I can see this conversation to go round and round. Um, what I can see out of this is there's some opportunity to uh, at least make the climate change uh, minister uncomfortable. It'd be dead easy to draft questions to him and demand straight answers that you know you're not going to get because it involves uh, science that's outside the international rules. Two minutes. Yes. Okay, thank you for your contribution. What is the answer you want us to what? The best option would be put together a small group, a think, a think tank, if you like, the farmers, to draft those questions that, that I've mentioned, uh, to present to the board for their approval, and if they approve of it, they can send it to the minister in an open letter. Okay, so it goes to the media as well. Okay, so this knowing is knowing perfectly well that he he won't give you a straight answer. Okay, so this it. is additional to the remit, but more than happy for you to send that through to the board if you'd like to. Yep, fine. Cool. Thank you. Question at the back. Ian. Yes, Mr Walsh. Chairman, uh, Ian Walsh from Pew Pew. It's not a question, it's a compliment. Um, today, I believe I've had a return on my 63 years levy pain. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. It was very profound, accompanied by other speakers like Jane and Hamish and others. It's very clear, a very clear message. And there is hope. I was betting that in three years' time you'd be, we'd be gone. But there is hope. We have leadership in the ranks. So I'm all for that. I'm very active, as you know, in, in mentoring a lot of farmers under the covers. And thank God for these young guys. We have a future. I think that's all I'd like to say. Thank you, Ian. Hamish. Just a couple of quick things. We say we've got to look for an alternative, you know. Obviously we're against change or something like that. But anyway, to me, the obvious pathway is the ETS. I mean, we've just planted 8% of our farm in trees. What more do they want us to do? And every single sheep and beef farmer has the opportunity to do that on their farms right now. And when I talk to plenty of climate activists, they say the best thing you can do right now is plant a tree. And here we are, wanting to do a whole convoluted elephant, another IRD through Heiwaka Ikanoa, millions of our money to set it up and to administrate it. So every dollar of mine that goes from my farm into their coffers ends up being 60 cents I'd rather keep the money in my pocket and plant a tree. Thank you.
Thanks, Amos. I will just make one closing statement. Go home, do you know your number, time your methane by 28% and then work out the reducing allocations over the years and then time your nitrous oxide by 296 times the current carbon price, times the reducing allocations. You may have a different view. Thank you. We will finish up that remit. We will move on to remit number eight. Uh, Roger Dalrymple couldn't make it today, he's an apology. So Kirsten, you're coming to presenting here today. Welcome to the stage. Hey, thanks everyone. Um, clearly I'm not Roger. And um, I'm pretty confident Roger is uh, watching from the South Island. And you know I'm not Roger because I've got way more hair and I'm decades younger. So that's for you, Rog, uh, for landing me. <laughs> yes, I'm that much younger. Um, and look, I just want to take a message from today is that um, we were told this morning that, um, that w there's a different world. There's the one that's reality and there's the one that we would wish to be in. Well, my reality right now is I'd much rather be in Hawaii than here, but... That's, that, that's me. So um, I guess my remit, or Roger, Roger's remit, is, is kind of a complementary to Jason. Jason beautifully articulated that uh, he's proposing that beef and lamb pull out of Haywaka. I guess I'm proposing via this remit, via Roger and the other signatories, not so much to pull out of Haywaka, but if beef and lamb genuinely believe that they can achieve some changes and some alterations in the outcomes for farmers as a result of staying in uh, Haywaki Ekanoa, then, then that's essentially what this remit is about. Um, I'm sorry for you guys. It might be a bit like Jace's uh, grandmother's reheated cabbage and lentil soup because you're going to probably hear some common messaging um, that's come through this afternoon, but so apologies in, in advance um, for the reheated cabbage and lentil soup. One thing I really want to point out, I haven't, and I'll push back on some of the speakers this morning, who perhaps assume that farmers don't want to pay a tax. I haven't heard that. None of us want to pay a tax, but I haven't heard one farmer today say pull out of... Um, your responsibility to contribute to uh, New Zealand's uh, emissions reductions aspirations. So I'd like to put that on the record that I haven't heard a farmer say that today. Uh, no deal's better than a bad deal. At least that's what it was supposed to be. This remit is a response to the bad deal that Haywaka Ekanoa Partnership delivered to government on behalf of New Zealand sheep and beef farmers and other farmers last year, and it's yet another attempt to help facilitate a better one for the future of our industry. The rationale for this remit was clearly outlined in the papers, and thanks heaps to Beef and Lamb for your responses and actually all the work that you've done to this point. It seems like Beef and Lamb largely appear to agree with the sentiments of, of Roger's remit, but in doing so, all they've done is simply further expose the reality. That's the original Haywind framework that's flawed, and to continue to call on the government to take a cautious approach or use the lowest possible price does not alter that reality. Any tinkering from here is simply putting lipstick on a pig. It's still a pig, and it's still not one that you want to take home to meet mum and dad. So as a reminder, Haywaka presented a template where a price was going to be put on the entirety of the sector's emissions. And because it was a, decided to bop, apply it at the farm level, it will also be on the entirety of your farm's emissions. Cost to farmers, thousands, tens of thousands a year. The system's going to be delivered by this administrative juggernaut. And bear in mind, we've used figures that have come directly out of the uh, materials from both Haywaka and, and the government. So 100 plus million to set up and 80 odd million per year to operate, paid for by farmers. The price to be paid will be negotiated or overseen by the sector based on factors like affordability and speed of reductions. 
But let's be real here. The system needs a minimum price just to generate revenue to sustain itself. Cost to farmers. Subject to negotiation? Unsure. Tools currently available to help reduce emissions. Planting trees and or reducing stock numbers. Cost to farmers? Thousands. Tens of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. Sequestration offsets? Still being negotiated. Still paid for by farmers. Rewards for reductions on farm when you achieve the 10% target? Zero. Just keep paying. Modelled risk of offshore emissions leakage, significant. Funding left for research and development, minimal, if any. We all know from the modelling done that the financial impacts for farmers in our communities are going to be significant, especially for low-intensity, extensive and regenerative farm systems, those of us who are inefficient. Already the loss of confidence in the future of hill country farming is having a profound effect. Where Paul and I farm, it's gut-wrenching, gut-wrenching, to see the exodus of farming families in the so-called unproductive hill country, the breeding ground for so much of our red meat sector being engulfed by pine plantations. And all this Haywalker model will do is further supercharge the demise of this beautiful land covered in native bush and accelerate the proliferation of carbon forestry. It's happening where we live. You can't promote and support a policy platform which will suck hundreds of millions of farmer dollars out of the sector and out of our communities every year and expect anything else. So I guess what we think is, is that the original hay wind comes from three core defects. Firstly, it places a tax on all emissions instead of what we're legally required to reduce. If 10% is the reduction target, why wouldn't you use that as the goal and take ownership of that as different sectors and as individual farmers within that sector? It's kind of like a speeding ticket. When you get caught doing 110 in a 100k zone, the fine is for the 10 over the 100, not the whole speed. Why wouldn't you give us, as individuals, the opportunity to figure out how we're going to get there? We're not stupid. On one farm, that might be more planting. On another, it might be that that farmer simply says, OK, I'm going to reduce my stock numbers to a point where I've hit the 10% reduction since 2017. Just let me do it. Just give me the target and I'll hit the goal. And once that goal's achieved, we don't pay any more. So we just say, just text the target. The second major defect in the hay wind design is how the price is to be set. How did the partners ever contemplate that pricing by committee, by negotiation with no link to any credible formula, was ever going to be a robust way to design a system? It's lame. Instead, what Hay Walker came up with were criteria like how fast or slow the sector is moving on its total emissions reductions, and on what individual farmers and sectors can manage to pay without sending them broke. This concept is not only unpalatable, it's actually insulting. How much tax can the peasants afford this year? It's a shocker. Using pricing to manipulate farmer behaviour like a lever to dial up or down in response to what others are doing is controlling us like rats in a maze. So we say link pricing to a credible and predictable mechanism. The third core defect of the Haywen plan comes from this holy grail of the much lauded Team Ag, we're all in this together mantra. Fantastic. Other remits cover why this is a problem, but let's be real here. Because emissions are all lumped together as Team Ag, the target is achieved as Team Ag. So as the hill country is engulfed by exotic forestry, stock numbers evaporate and communities are deserted, the real reductions have come from the exit of hill country sheep and beef farmers. Great for the dairy team um, part of the system, not so great for us. So we say recognise and reward emissions reductions by sector so sheep and beef aren't picking up the slack for others. It's been really heartening to see beef and lamb at last begin to subtly change their positioning. In last week's Farmers Weekly advertisement, Beef and Lamb highlighted some of their key issues. They wrote, If sheep and beef emissions are dropping in line with legislated targets, 
Why the need for charges? They wrote, emissions pricing when there are no solutions doesn't make sense. They wrote, driving down emissions in New Zealand only to be picked up by a less efficient country doesn't make sense. We completely agree. Many of, this have, many of us have been saying this for over 12 months. The problem with this messaging is, of course, that it's utterly incongruous with the original h -Wen design, a design that Beef and Lamb to continue to stand by, despite the fundamental flaws that I've just outlined. It's still a bad deal. It's still unfair, inequitable, still threatens farmability, farmer viability, and does result in emissions leakage. All points that Beef and Lamb have stated reflect a bad deal. They know it's wrong, just like we know it's wrong. So this remit now, once again, calls on Beef and Lamb to change their behaviour. Time to acknowledge the reality that the framework they handed to government as a signatory to HWEN was flawed. To be courageous and do the right thing for the future of sheep and beef farming families. Time to run, stop running along the sideline and time to get back in the game. If Beef and Lamb truly believe that the Team Ag partnership approach is the best, time to grab the whistle and drive the change to reimagine, redesign and insist on a better system. Insist on a change of direction which will address the core defects of the original and one that can evolve to reflect new science. It's not too late. Farmers will come in behind and back a system that makes sense and they will back you in making a stand. There's a strong R&D value proposition for sheep and beef research. Put it on the tables to, for farmers to consider outside of the taxation system. That way we can measure it. We can monitor it. The money go around hasn't sucked all that money in for unknown outputs. We need something that's enduring and something that offers our farmers a way forward. We need a point in the future when we can potentially be climate change heroes rather than the perpetual bad guy. We believe that any model must have a point where you're now good and you're free to go. It should never have been this or the ETS. It should have been something aspirational, but more than that, it should have been something achievable. Thanks, Kirsten. Any comments to this remit? Hamish Belsky. You may. Thank you. Uh, well done. Thank you, Kirsten. My only um, negative to that is, is the cost of setting up a system and running it, the administrative system, and in the end, you'll find that sheep and beef farmers uh, will meet their targets anyway through brilliant management, and then <laughs> you've got nothing to pay for it. But um, I just wanted one other comment about um, transparency or, or facts. So in the climate change document, this is what it read, why we need to reduce ag emissions. Climate change is increasing the frequency and severity of droughts in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The primary sector is particularly vulnerable. From 2007 to 17, drought cost the country around 270 million. And when I read that, I thought, I've been through three years of drought now. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. All right? Bear with me. So I thought I'd investigate and looked on the NEWA website and got a research paper. And it says in the abstract, there is st no statistically significant difference in area and drought between the two indices averaged over time series and no national scale trends in drought occurrence are identified. Hmm, misinformation. So was straight away when I read that, I no longer trust what has been put forward. And so if we just dig deeper and deeper and deeper into what the claims are, you'll start to expose a whole lot of lies and deception. 
Any other people want to speak to this amendment? Jane? Thank you. Um, I just wanted a question. Um, both Kirsten and Jason had referenced Beef and Lamb's change in direction in terms of really asking for warming targets that we've been speaking about for the past 18 months to two years. Can we assume that, that, that if we do get those warming targets, that Beef and Lamb, well, Hawaka Ikenaua will become defunct because there won't be enough money to run the system anyway that we've heard about? There will not be enough money to run Hawaka Ikenaua if we are genuinely at warming targets? Uh, Beef and Lamb's always been on the record saying we don't agree with the targets and, of course, we'd like science to inform those targets. Anyone that jumps to the assumption that that's going to land on GWP star, go away and read your latest Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment, Simon Upton's report, and you may go into this process with less confidence that you're going to land on that. This is the complexity of all these things. Never assume that you're going to land at the point you want to, and this is the complexity of what we're having to deal with. So, so well, it's, it's actually very simple, Andrew. Are, are you gunning for g genuinely really trying for warming targets, or are you not? Because if you are, then you should be pulling out of Haywaka Ikenaua because it's just it, it cannot function. You know, I just answered that question, Jane. You're making the assumption that the, the warming target informed by science will be the one that we want, there is multiple um, warming targets that science may inform where this okay. lands. Well, that's his point. If you're so going that, into negotiations with that that front of mind... Well, no, no, no I'm, I'm saying target. the reality is it has to be science-informed targets. You cannot stand hand on heart and accept anything so, else. So why would you go into Haywaka Ikenai as a partner without having science-informed targets in the first place? Again, and that, jumped on And that, that is why we've argued all the way that we don't agree with the targets. Right. It would so, be great if we could get clarity around the targets. Climate Change Commission, everyone says, it would be great if we could get clarity around the targets because that informs the system you build afterwards. OK. So we can assume that you will be potentially pulling out of Haywalk Eke now? No, I wouldn't put words in. Well, I'm not going to be there. It's, I'm not going to be in the board. The board will make that decision. Let's not put words in anyone's mouth. OK. Any other statements or comments to be made here? Erica Van Reenen. How much time have we got, Lundy? We've actually made up a lot of time. This is quite crucial, so I don't mind if we go a bit over. Erica. I'm not sure I want to say anything, especially <laughs> up against Kirst. Um, I, so that I'm wearing my Ag First hat now. Um, I just thought it would be useful to understand what will potentially happen if beef and lamb withdraws from Hewaka Ikenaua from being involved with the process, so please don't throw rotten tomatoes at me. Um, if beef and lamb pulls out of the partnership, that means the partnership no longer exists. However, government have reported their Section 215 report, which was the report that came out in December, as they were legislatively required to do. And that sets a process in place that government have been working towards uh, for the past few months since that came in. And uh, Cabinet are, are imminently going to make decisions that will start the regulatory process to implement that report. That report is a requirement of the Climate Change Response Act. So if we withdraw, that means no partnership. That means the work that is still going on between government and the partnership will no longer happen. And what that means in practice is that the sector cannot sit around the table to have practical discussions with officials and I've been involved with a lot of these discussions and your perspectives and views have definitely been heard and have changed officials' views before policy has been written and gone out for consultation. I agree with many of the comments around how that consultation process has occurred, but in terms of beef and lamb influencing officials, that has been very strong in my view and my involvement with the process. So I think it is important to understand what we would be dealing with, which would be much more of an advocacy consultative process where government put out a proposal and Beef and Lamb as advocates, if that's what we as farmers want them to do, will consult and go back and forth as we do. And much of the conversation today has been about not having that process, has been having more about 
constructive conversations. So I just wanted to make that point. Thanks. Thank you, Erica. Um, is the is the, the crowd happy if we go over time on this? Yep. Cool. Graham Gleeson. Okay, let's go for five minutes. Look, Erica raised a very valid point, and we, we need to hear that. If you recall back from my remit, I said that, you know, we need to start flipping the conversation at times. And flipping the conversation may be just putting up other alternative models. And one of the alternative models, which would be particularly pertinent for our sector, is that we have a very low environmental footprint across the whole suite of the environment, when you look at climate, you think that New Zealand has a very low um, greenhouse gas emission per product. We also have a very low footprint on our freshwater relative to other land users. We have a very high amount of biodiversity on our farms. Now, flipping the conversation may mean that we could be selling the opportunity for us overseas. We heard from Greg Skimmings and... Um, so I forget the guy's name from MFAT. But, uh, you know, our credentials, I would have thought, stood very, very high. And if we were to flip the conversation to achieve the targets in the manner that we can feasibly do, isn't that not a win for our sector? It's putting that alternative on the table rather than just sticking with a, a system that gets railroaded as a singular option. I think we need to be uh, giving farmers credit that, you know, help them choose which way is the better from a number of different ones. And it was far more better than just HWN or the ETS. There must surely be other ways, other alternative pathways to follow through on. So I think we need to flip the conversation, how to get everybody on side, and then go forward. Well, do we have a speaker in the middle here, Laurie? Did you want to? Yeah, just uh, following up on uh, what Erica said, really, where, uh, sorry, you know, if beef and lamb. Sorry, just Laurie, Laurie Patterson from Southland. Sorry, Laurie. Yeah, if uh, beef and lamb go, the partnership's broken. But when this was set up originally, it was touted and it was in every newspaper all around how the partnership was between the government and the sector leaders. And then when it came down to signing the thing, the government walked away anyway. So that broke the partnership. Now we've got a partnership, another partnership. So, you know, I just think we've got to relook at the whole thing and get some credible um, things on the table. Otherwise, uh, sheep and beef farmers out there are going broke. Simple as that. They've got to sell to pines or they're gone. Any other comments? One down here, Nils. Uh, yeah, and else hands I'm I'm still confused about the whole Hewaki Kanoa outcome because in my head we're going to be charged tax on every single physical kilo we produce. And as an intensive hill country farmer, I'm just going to produce more because I'm going to make a marginal difference. So in the end, I'm going to produce more emissions to make more money to pay this bloody tax. And the other side of the coin is the average farmer that's 62 years old or whatever he is, he hasn't got an outlet now where he can just say, oh, well, I'm sick of this, I'll just reduce my stocking rate 10%. I think that's the, the hardest thing for me to, to uh, witness is the farmers that are not going to be capable of engaging in this w without worrying about water and all the other stuff, where they could have had an out by just saying, I'll bugger it, I'll have 200 ewes less and then I'm out of this out of the game. One back here, Kirsten. Sorry, I was Roger before, now I'm Kirsten. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess from the outcome from, from this remit is, I, I guess I, better than many in this room, know what you guys are up against as a board, right? I get it. It's hard. So I wonder if the outcome of the remit and in your decisions, if you pick up the sentiments that come from the farmers in this room and, and the stuff in the remits, and I know that you know there's, there's policy being done, there's legislation being written, da 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 but it doesn't end there. And I guess what the, the team in this room is saying is um, take what 
take the message that we as a team of farmers have, have given you in terms of some possible messaging, solutions, blah, 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 and, and keep, keep going because just because the government might come up with something now, it doesn't mean it's done. Um, and if we can have some cons consistent messaging, then, then we should get there because no one in their right mind thinks it's an awesome idea to just keep paying until you die. It's nuts. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up there. I just want to make a few points to our board. I won't be there. None of these systems are proposed of taxing into perpetuity. It's set up so that you can balance your ledger and you will not be taxed into perpetuity under the A plus B minus C model. Um, we've got two conflicting remits here for our board to consider, one to exit, one to proposal eight is do a lot of the stuff that we're trying to do anyway. So these are two conflicting remits. I want you guys to understand that. I also want you guys to understand that we had a conversation from trade negotiators and from market this morning that doing nothing is not an option. And so I'm just trying to put the complexity, as I say, I won't be in the room making decisions, so it doesn't make any difference what statements I make here because I won't be there. The point being, this is a classic example of getting conflicting messages around what people want. I take your point, Kirsten, the sentiment is that nobody's happy with what is being proposed. Erica makes a great point of be careful what you ask for because if we, are, we do leave the room, um, let's consider what the risk profile is there. Okay. Okay, that was proposal number eight. Proposal number nine, Rick Burke, welcome to the stage. Kia ora, everyone. And... Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving us the opportunity and the board. Um, and where's Cros? He's disappeared. But, oh, there's Cros down there. Cros, thank you uh, for finding this remit that slipped off your desk. And uh, <laughs> I don't know where it ended up, but you got it back online, and uh, we appreciate that. And the comments from uh, just rubbing shoulders a few of the those that um, put up remits um, compliment you, uh, you know, very well in terms of how you've handled all this. Um, so obviously a lot of work for you. So those that don't know me, my name is um, is Rick Burke and uh, I'm a sheep and beef farmer from the Bay of Plenty. I have served on the Beef and Lamb Mid uh, Northern Farmer Council for t 12 years. I'd stood down um, late last year. Three, uh, three years of the 12 years I was as chairman, which is um, really rewarding. And um, also I've been a member of the um, Beef and Lamb Environment Reference Group. I'm also uh, chairman of a group called Farmers for Positive Change, which put up this remit, uh, which is a farming group which um, emerged in 2016 to challenge aspects of the Waikato Plan Change 1. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a background about that. Um, so Farmers for Positive Change believe this remit is of national importance for our sheep and beef sector. The issue is, for our sector, um, we have no organisation giving us 100% advocacy support. The allocation of dairy levy funds collected by Beef and Lamb New Zealand have never been clearly defined. <clears throat> they just go into a pool of funds collected by Beef and Lamb New Zealand. So dairy have the ability to lean on beef and lamb New Zealand, particularly in the advocacy, advocacy space. Every, every opportunity, every opportunity um, and you've heard a lot about it this today, and this is not a beat up on um, dairy, my dairy farmer friends, and Bryce is one, become a friend over here. It's um, dairy, big business dairies are highly organised, they're highly geared, they've got the numbers, they've got the weight, um, and we're just the second cousins. So don't think I'm beating up on our dairy farmer um, cousins. It's more about big business dairy. So I'm saying um, at every opportunity, big business dairy will try and use the sheep and beef sector to offset their environmental footprint. And you've heard a lot about that today, as I said. This is clearly evident within the, in the development of past uh, regional freshwater policy frameworks. 
and I, I hope I'm not sort of repeating myself. Uh, some of these, are, some of this has been covered off, but think about the grand printing of nitrogen in Canterbury, and the attempted grand printing of nitrogen um, in Plan Change One in the Waikato, and that's an ongoing battle. And we, um, I'll, I'll mention, she and Beef Sector put in a massive effort to uh, through the hearings process, and that might be under, being undermined just as we speak. Um, Jason alluded to that. Um, in both cases, um, Dairy have set up to use the sheep and beef sector um, as the whipping boys to offset their nitrogen loss. If we look at the plan change one in the Waikato, four farming groups comprising of mainly sheep and beef farmers and farmers for positive change was one. Um, Jason from the Hill, Hill Country River Group, um, King Country River Care, and the primary uh, land users group arose to, um, to, fi to fight against grandparenting and the notified plan at the time. Therefore, through that process, uh, Beef and Lamb New Zealand had no option but to fall in behind the farming groups. Um, I'll make it quite clear, Beef and Lamb weren't at the forefront at the start. They fell in behind us. Um, and to Matt Harkham's um, um, work at the time, um, we put a lot of pressure on them to get Beef and Lamb involved in that. It was interesting. Um, oh, sorry, I lost my space here. Um, the, the farming groups and the farmers involved put in countless hours um, fighting for their industry um, through Plan Change 1 Waikato. It was interesting, there's no uprising of the dairy farmer groups. Dairy NZ and Fonterra said to their farmers to stay at home, we've got your backs. But we, with day jobs, had to fight tooth and nail and um, spent hours and hours of time uh, doing that. More recently in the HEWEN discussions, dairy, being the biggest player in the room, have controlled what should have been a collaborative process. To create an outcome where emissions pricing is averaged from the most intensive to the most extensive farms, farm systems. The result would be for many sheep and beef, extensive sheep and beef farms would be priced out of farming, and you've heard a lot about that today. Even our Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, in describing the outcomes from here, and said the sheep and beef sector had been poorly served by our farming leaders. In recent times, dairy have had overwhelming advocacy support within Dairy NZ Fonterra, where the sheep and beef sector has no organisation giving them 100% advocacy support. So what we're saying is um, beef and lamb have the ability to define where the dairy levy is allocated by separating out the portion of dairy levy income, not utilising it for any advocacy work on behalf of the dairy industry. The remaining dairy beef levy would be reallocated into a market access, research and development, farmer extension and research, people development and insights as per the status quo. Now, there's been a bit of, um, bit of stuff in the paper and a few dairy boys a bit upset about this proposal, but look, the dairy guys, as, as beef and lamb staff would uh, would um, back me up on this, they get a they get a massive payback, and we heard about it today with a market access. I don't know what would be uh, their return on on that investment and their levy would be massive. So this would give the what we're asking is is to do this. This would give beef and lamb the ability to advocate purely on for the sheep and beef sector. And look, we've got a clear difference between sheep and beef and dairy. They are starkly different. This is just a fact of life. Um, just think about, and we heard a bit about today, comparing taste pure nature and a dairy marketing approach. One is almost a regenerative approach to farming and the other is a focus on greater intensity, production and efficiency. You know, I, I sometimes wonder if beef and lamb have an identity crisis not knowing really who to serve or promote. This needs to be addressed as per remit six that Jane put up around the independent advocacy review. This has just got to happen. I mean, things don't stay the same. We've evolved as a sector, and beef and lamb has evolved, which I was a part of through the Farmer Council, etc., cetera, um, into a great organisation. With all this regulation coming, it's, I think it's time for a reset. A big part of this is advocating for 100% for their sheep and beef farms. And I, I'd suggest they could be using the principles sitting in, in behind Taste Pure Nature. Our sheep and beef sector and 
and steer our ship and be in a positive direction of travel. Um, and it's not perhaps just beef and lamb doing this. I think we've got to rethink how we advocate um, a lot more strongly. And it might be MIA stepping up to the plate. We've got an MIA representative here. Yes. I think MIA have been missing in action. Um, I, I, I believe MIA need to grow a bloody another leg and get in and work with beef and lamb and support their sheep and beef farmers. You've heard today how Hewaka Kana is going to affect the extensive sheep and beef farmers. And that's your, that's your, um, that's your critical mass that's going to be exiting the industry. So you guys need to seriously think about it. And this is all part of the review as I see it. I mentioned, um, sort of driving the changes, um, through the, by using some of the principles um, in behind Taste Pure Nature to really differentiate ourselves. And that's an awesome opportunity. And that's been spoken about today. I'd just like to um, reference some of that thought to Phil Weirs. <coughs> Phil Weir over here is chairman of um, um, Mid Northern Farmer Council. Phil has just done a Nuffield, which is sponsored by Beef and Lamb. Um, I'd like to reference uh, yeah, that, that thought to some of Phil Work's work he's done through his Nuffield, and, um, and, and I think the, the board have an opportunity to really think about that. I don't know if Phil would like to make some comments on that, but um, I think we've just got to have a whole rethink um, through a review process on where we're heading in the future. So we are fit for purpose. Thank you, Rick. One question I would ask if you just find me where the Prime Minister referenced the uh, poor, the sheep and beef sector was poorly represented by its farming leaders. If you could forward that on to me rather than making that statement. Yes, I'll find that for you. Anyway. Yep. It might be exactly in those words. Well, if you're going to say things like that. <laughs> Yeah, you may have. So I will pull that up when you uh, make statements like that. So I find that frustrating. Okay, well, that's different than the Prime Minister, isn't it? Well, not really. <laughs> okay, any speakers to this remit? What we have witnessed over the years, oh, sorry, sorry, Phil, go. Uh, Phil Weir, uh, mid-northern North Island farmer and uh, recent Nuffield scholar. Um, so I looked at, as part of my Nuffield, um, the structure of industry, good bodies, and looked at the, the role of the Commodity Levies Act and a range of other things. And um, as part of my travel, looked at some case studies and uh, South America and, and in the UK. And I suppose there's quite a nicely written report that you can find online, so I won't go into that. But really the, the, the key observation that I found from looking abroad was uh, a separation between extension and, and political advocacy. So one thing that I've heard a lot today is that we're asking for, um, on one hand, um, our organisation to have a stronger political advocacy voice, and then on the other hand, uh, to be still doing a whole lot of the extension. So I guess at one level, maybe we need to pick with beef and lamb, whether we're wanting beef and lamb to be focused on the building of bullets or the firing of them, um, to sort of simplify it down. I mean, in other instances, legislation sort of um, requires the separation of those two functions. So um, it, it's complicated um, from my own perspective starting this. I wasn't coming in to look at industry good bodies from a perspective that um, they weren't doing enough. I was just challenged by the fact that as a farmer myself, I gain most of my income from dairy grazers. I grow maize um, and then I, I also sell some sheep and beef. So is the structure and the organisations that represent me to make me a better farmer and then advocate on my behalf uh, best suited? So I've done a bit of thinking about it. It's probably written down. I won't hold up any more time. Thanks. Thank you, Indiana Speakers. Yep, be on the back, sorry. Uh, yeah, Mark Hooper, Taranaki. Um, sorry, and I appreciate this uh, <clears throat> this this remit, and, and I think the point just made there was quite good, but I had I had a question on the 
previous remit, and I just I just want to put that because I, I think it's quite um, pertinent because it gives us some indication of where things are sitting at at present. And I'm not sure if the board can answer this question or not, but um, two hours ago there was a, <coughs> a deadline uh, for the Hewaki Ekenoa partners to indicate whether they were going to sign uh, a letter going to the ministers written by the steering group um, this, earlier this week. And I'm just wondering if the board is able to answer whether they have agreed to put their signature to that letter or not. It's quite interesting you would do that, Mark, because that's sort of kind of exposing us as we're making discussions. The point being, no, we haven't signed that letter, and I do not want that reported here today. So thanks for doing that, Mark, but not thanks for doing that. <laughs> OK? <laughs> because you probably knew that answer, didn't you? No, I didn't know that. OK. <laughs> How could we sign that letter when we still have to consider the remit? Yes, it is good, yeah. So frustrating, as I say, that that would be asked in a public reported forum. Okay. Um, okay, um, any other comments on this remit? One thing that I would ask the board to consider, as I say, I won't be there, that, you know, to delineate between the colour of an animal versus an intensity factor is quite often a different conversation. Okay. That's the conclusion of the remits. Any other comments before we move off remits? Any, want to take a minute to make any statements or anything? Lindy. So, I'm Lindy Nelson, she can be farmer <laughs> from Ekarahuna. I just put my, I just put my little uh, timer on. Um, I've loved today and thanks very much for the uh, conversation and thank God we have an organisation and a farming group where we can have really what is democracy, because we haven't had a lot of that in the last few years. I guess what I'm really interested in is when are we going to solve this problem? Because with that man down the back, we're on our way for our, to Taupo to our 36th wedding anniversary. And three weeks after I met him, he went to Parliament. He didn't drive his tractor up the stairs, but he was in a in a mob who went to Parliament around the fart tax. And 36 years later, we still haven't solved this problem. And so I'm going to put it to you, when are we actually going to do that? Because what I've seen in the last few years at least is an attempt to bring it to a conclusion. And what really worries me is if we don't, the conclusion is going to be brought to us. So that's just a little uh, comment. Thanks, Lindy. Look, on that similar light, my wife texted me and said, we are always judged by our actions rather than our opinions. And therein lies the challenge. We've been having this discussion for 20 years. There's some stuff that's really hard to get through this stuff. Beef and Lamb made an active decision to not be judged by our opinions, but to be judged by our actions. And that will be telling on us. And it's a hard, hell of a hard journey to go on. So anyone that's been in these rooms, Kirsten, you especially will know how hard this is. So to reference, you know, there was a bunch of references there that you could spend a bunch of time talking with people around how people throw people under buses in different rooms. We are trying to move away from that model. So anything that divides our sector, I will challenge, will weaken our sector. And I'll make that statement pretty strongly. Ja Thank you. Um, I've just had a number of um, messages from people watching this online, just wanting you to define your statement before, something about the colour and intensity. What, what, it was quite disingenuous. Oh, well, d making d differentiations by the colour of an animal as to how you treat your levy payer, it, you will have just as intensive models in sheep and beef as you will, and you'll have some less intensive models in dairy. So to always make the assumption that this is intensive, these are intense, these guys are low, I, I would challenge that belief system. But not if you let us do that down to farm level, I guess. That's the other, the other challenge, isn't it? Well, everyone, this, so this is the measuring and monitoring of farm. You'll have an indication of impact. And this, and this has been borne out many times in the nutrient, uh, nutrient allocation debate. Okay. 
We'll move on to general business. Now, Hugh Gardine is going to table a motion here. Hugh, can I invite you to the stage? This is the one that is on your table. I hope you've all had a chance to read it. Hugh will table the motion, then we'll look for a seconder, and then we will open this up for discussion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I um, drove down the valley this morning, I thought it was an op could have been an opportunity. I could have given you a ride um, because I uh, could return the favour because I think you've perhaps been taking me for a ride for the last couple of years. Uh, look, I'd like to thank all the previous speakers, those that proposed the remits, uh, for your eloquence for your passion and for your conviction to the cause. And uh, it, it, it uh, uh, makes me feel that we're in, the industry is in good heart when we've got people uh, like you and, and those that you're representing uh, present taking an interest. Uh, the presentation I've got to make today is at the result of meetings in Gorn and Vicargal. And, and that was at the time when Beef and Lamb uh, toured the country and presented on the uh, changes the government had made to the to, to the Hewen report, and uh, we got in effect a lecture, and it wasn't till the end of the meeting that we passed motions to the effect that we opposed the government's amendments, we opposed the the, the Hewen uh, document, and we moved a motion that at a future AG uh, convened meeting of Beef and Lamb we'd present a motion of no confidence, and here we are today. Um, and uh, to do just that. Uh, given the division around EWN and the board's relationship with the government, it, would be it will be instructive for Beef and Lamb to have this vote or to receive the response from levy payers that are opposed to it. Beef and Lamb's mandate is clear, to grow the sheep and beef industries and provide sustain sustainable returns now and for future generations. It is my opinion that beef and lamb have been distracted from that mandate by this government's agenda to replace good farmland with exotic forests, co-producing the Hewen Doc uh, report, not opposing the government when it overrode the report with their own amendments, and lastly, standing with the government before Christmas, signing off on Labor's emissions pricing plan. The pricing plan, James Shaw described it as a high-level plan, but it was bereft of detail, and it was, in my opinion, just a starting point for future gener governments to increase the emissions levy and progressively tax New Zealand farming out of existence. Other countries incentivise agriculture, but not New Zealand. Minister James Shaw was quoted in regards to the emissions setting that the system as proposed was not perfect. There are possibly simpler, more effective systems, but the political economy is that the sector leaders have said this is the system they want. Political, political economy indeed. Former Prime Minister Lucinda Ardern said she was committed to as low a levy as possible because it was not a revenue-raising exercise. Uh, the TUI billboard might come to mind there. You and board members appear to have become advocates for the government, contrary to the mandate and against the wishes of grassroots farmers. We levy, levy, uh, levy payers do not want to be legislated into any system that allows future coalition governments to tinker, tinker at will with future agricultural emissions, taxes and levies. Prior to the COP27 in Cairo 2022, the UN announced current expectations of global warming by 2050 might have been overstated by up to two degrees. Then just before Christmas, there was another announcement that stated the calculations of warming from methane might also be overstated with the net effect of reducing global warming calculations by one degree. The New Zealand Climate Change Commission chooses to ignore this information and remember that global warming currently is 1.2 degrees Celsius above what it was early in the 1800s pre-discovery in the use of fossil fuels. The global, global warming debate has to be differentiated from changing weather patterns. I exaggerate when I say we could be looking at a global catastrophe of warming of one or two degrees in 30 years. 
James Shaw was quoted, what a catastrophe 1.1 degree of warming had caused on the East Coast. NASA confirmed that Cyclone Gabriel was a weather event and not attributable to climate change. So do you believe NASA or do you believe James Shaw? William Briggs says, if you want a climate crisis, you first elect Minister of Climate Change. New Prime Minister Chris Hipkins recently announced to suspend the biofuel mandate that would reduce emissions from transport. Such an announcement will alarm every New Zealand farmer when he states he has other options, and one of which is increasing the targeted methane taxes on our already long-suffering agricultural sector. Many qualified and distinguished scientists have stepped forward with an analysis of emissions, their impact and longevity, but beef and lamb seem to be stuck with government recommended advisors working from modelling, arriving at conclusions the data they enter determines. Dr Frank Mitalona, brought to New Zealand by Beef and Lamb and promoted as an internationally renowned expert to explain methane and its impact on climate change, admitted on the transcript when questioned in Christchurch on the relevance of his presentation to New Zealand, stated he didn't know he wasn't a climate scientist. He did explain, however, that methane only needs to be reduced and doesn't, does not need to go to zero as methane is a short-lived gas that does not add additional warming. His words, not mine. Carbon dioxide, on the other hand, has to get to zero to not add additional warming and to be negative to reverse previous warming. Of course, pastoral farming here is totally reliant on carbon CO2. In New Zealand, nearly all the methane emissions from agricultural production are, are enteric, created by belching. In California, enteric methane is not even counted towards emissions reduction targets. Similarly, hedgerows and thickets in the UK are eligible for sequestration credits, but not New Zealand. Beef and lamb should highlight these inequalities around the world and seek consistency. David Frame should have done his prep on emissions on Farewell Spit and Egmont to measure what the world sent us and compare the data with readings from Capes Palliser or Kidnappers to provide us with site-specific, informed, practical science. I'm sure he'd have no shortage of solar and wind power for his modelling on, on any of those sites. The Paris Accord 1973 is explicit that there is to be no reduction in food production, and that is a pillar of the Paris Accord, not to be set aside for our government's attention seeking a destructive agenda. Beef and lamb should add that advocated to the government as this is a bottom line and stop grandstanding with government for the emissions pricing exercise. The Commissioner for the Environment states there is no reduced warming from most sectors except the sheep sector. Government policy needs to be redirected to sectors that produce warming instead of it is eliminating the one sector that has reduced warming 30% since 1990. And I'll wager no government in New Zealand would commit to political suicide and put farming into the EDS. The UN opposes international offset, offsetting, yet New Zealand government is still encouraging it. Only Labor could damage the economy and the environment with the same policy. In conclusion, New Zealand farmers are already doing their bit. They're seeking solutions with science and practicing good animal and pasture husbandries. They should never be compromised beyond any measures adopted in other countries. Cows in India, beef in South America, sheep in China will continue emissions untaxed ad infinitum and our government will willingly sacrifice the most efficient world farmers and facilitate their former customers around the world to eat food from higher emitting sources. It is expected one and a half to two billion people will be protein deficient by 2050, yet reducing New Zealand beef and sheep production can only increase that number. Under current ETS settings, ANZ Susan, Susan Kilsby estimates it is expected a half a million hectares of land to be converted to forestry by 2035. That is about 2,000 farms converted to forestry resulting in a 20 to 30 percent increase in the area plant exotic forests. Mostly radiata exported to and used in China for boxing, for pallets, framing and mat sticks. And past its use date, generally by in two years and burnt. If used locally, it has to be treated, such as the quality of the timber. It is not logical to tax farmers. 
The money could be applied to forestry, riparian and erosion planting. The objective surely is to reduce emissions. The elephant in the room is the fund that James Shaw needs to meet government's offshore global warming commitments. Is it $20 million or is it $50 million? Have no doubt it is coming out of your pocket. I've been a strong advocate of beef and lamb uh, all my farming life, uh, but the board's collaboration with this Labour government is unprecedented. Meetings arranged to inform us on he when and discuss the government's response have been straight out lectures with no time or inclination to listen to any opposing solutions. This is a time of reckoning. Beef and lamb has not done enough to demand evidence of actual warming and the economic, social, environmental effects of government policies. The partners of Hewen have left, some partners of Hewen have left, or like Feds express reservations, yet Beef and Lamb have forsaken their mandate and continued to promote it. In my opinion, the board needs to reset. Beef and Lamb are remiss to not have proposed a vote of confidence in themselves today, given the opposition to Hewen, the opposition to the government response, and the over, overall relationship Beef and Lamb have fostered with government contrary to the mandate which was to grow, or is, to grow our industry and provide sustainable returns now and for future generations. Ladies and gentlemen, I move a vote of no confidence in Beef and Lamb Board specifically for the Board's involvement and support of he when, and I ask for a seconder. Thank you. So we've got uh, James Smith, Bryce McKenzie, Laurie Patterson, Hamish Carswell and Hamish Bowski as seconders. We've got that recorded. Thanks, Hugh. Thank you. No, it's all right. OK, um, the motion has been put and it has been seconded. So um, as the vote of no confidence is in the board, I will take the first opportunity to respond only on corrections in what is presented here. And then I will ask two of my board members to um, maybe respond and then I'll open up to the floor. Just want to correct inaccuracies in here, Hugh. You've stated that uh, beef and lamb, it's on that point. In my opinion, beef and lamb has been distracted from the mandate, not opposing the government when it overrode the report with their own amendments. We are on record as opposing that. So it's an incorrect statement. I'll uh, also incorrectly stay, uh, point out, lastly, standing with government before Christmas, signing off the labour emissions pricing. Once again, an inaccurate statement. We never supported that or are on record saying that. We do not support being levy payers, being legislated into a system. We've always been on record saying we do not support a pricing system. What I want to point out to you is you are currently in legislation. We are trying to extract you from it to build a workable system. Finally, when you made a comment there around Chris Hipkin saying when he states other options, one, increasing the target methane, this is not true because the levies are ring-fenced. I'm just pointing out. Also a statement, I'll wager no government in New Zealand will commit political suicide and put farming into the ETS we are already in the ETS as we sit. We are trying to get out of the ETS. Okay, so I would contest that a government would uh, do that. Finally, partners have left. No partners have left the, organ the, the partnership as of yet. Government, there's confusion around that, Laurie, because government whilst they sat in the room, were partners, but a ministry could never make a recommendation a, could a, to its minister. The minister has to make that decision. Oh, sorry, Laurie. Just so they, sorry, can we use the mic so I couldn't hear? I'm just sorry, but the government sat in the room with all the partners... And so the government actually knew what every partner was thinking. So when they walked away, uh, they had a lot of information about what you guys were doing. So, you know, that was a pretty uh, low trick on the government's part, I think. 
uh, everyone can have a view. Okay, um, can I ask Nikki Hislop and then Pete Connolly to come make a, say a few statements, and then I'll open up to the room. Nikki. Uh, no, just a mic if you want. Thank you. Um, look, I just want to start out by saying, um, I mean, look, you know, as, as certainly as a board member, as a sheep and beef farmer, it is, you know, it's, it is really disappointing and, and sad to, to have this motion come forward. But nevertheless, it's, it's certainly here. The other thing I just want to say is that, um, you know, I really want to thank those who have travelled, you know, the length of the, com of the country today to be here. And, and also the, um, you know, the really respectful debate we've had today. You know, it is really encouraging. You know, I think we've, um, it, it shows a whole lot of maturity about our sector. And yes, it's been robust, but that's okay. You know, and as a board, our ears are open. So I just really want to um, really highlight that. And I guess it really speaks to the commitment that everybody in this room has for our sector. Um, and, and it also um, it also speaks to the to the the want that you have for beef and lamb to be successful as as your representative, your facilitator, your negotiator around the table. So so um, thank you for that. With you know, God, we have had a huge amount of feedback um, over the last twelve months or couple of years culminating through to today. And, and certainly, you know, as a board, you know, we will be taking that on board. Kirsten, you um, you talked about within your remit that, you know, that Hawaka, and in my mind, Hawaka, even if stood up today, has got a shitload of panel beating to do. And and, and that, is, that is a given. But we need to get it into a, a format that you are comfortable with. And as Lindy said, you know, this isn't, this isn't going away. We've got to come up with something, but it's got to be tenable. It's got to be equitable. So we've heard, you know, I don't want to talk a whole lot more on the ins and outs of Hawaka over and above that, because I think there's been some really good discussion today. And, and we'll certainly, we've got a board meeting next week, um, and we'll certainly be um, obviously chewing through um, the, the remits that have come forward and um, a lot of the feedback you've given us. So thank you for that. I do really want to thank you for your honesty. Thank you. Pete. Kia ora, tato everyone. Um, look, I, I just wanted to start with a quick introduction. I'm Pete Conley. Um, I, today I wear a few hats. So firstly, I'm the CEO of Ansco Foods um, and Ansco is a levy levy payer. Um, I'm also on the MIA Council and um, I think about a month ago I came onto the Beef and Lamb Board. So just to reiterate Nikki's point, it is uh, disappointing that a motion would be moved um, the way it is. I, I guess, look, I, I've taken away from today a real clear message from, from everyone I've, I've heard from and, and we've got to lift our game. We've got to be better listeners and we've got to be better communicators. I think the other thing that I really um, has jumped out at me is there's been no playbook here. You know, we've, if we look back over the last three years, we've had COVID come at us and we've had issues like what we're dealing with here today with Haywaka e Ekinoa. Um, I want to drag it to, a, to another um, example and that's we got a phone call from the government telling us we were going into lockdown on a Monday night. And when we sat with Ray Smith and quizzed him on how we're going to run meat plants, he said to us, there's no rules. We don't know. So we had to act on the fly. Um, and we had to work a way to, to actually do that. And I th that for me, this conversation we're having, it feels like we're in that on a, on a far grander scale. Um, you know, we're, we're still trying to work our way through that playbook. You know, I've been in this industry 30 years and I, I, I love the passion, I love the, the you know, the, um, you know, really the enthusiasm that I've seen here today. I've got the same enthusiasm for the industry. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't here. And, I, you know, when I look at the markets, when I look globally, 
I've, in all that time, I've never seen uh, a more positive outcome from that perspective for us. So, you know, what I say is we're in this together. We, we need each other. Um, and the other thing I just, you know, jumped out at me today and, and I walked in on the tail end of um, Van Galley's presentation is just that real privileged market position that we have. We really need to appreciate that point. We've got, you know, as a country, we, we export 80, over 85% of the products we produce. We've got some of the most privileged market access in the world. We've got uh, the, the Brazilians, the Indians, they'd love our beef access. The Aussies would love our sheep meat access. We've got to protect that. Um, so, you know, I guess a few other things that jump out of me, you know, just think about the risks, the risks of doing nothing, the risks associated with how we are perceived globally, um, the risk of not delivering what our customers want, because I think some of that's tied up with this, um, and, and the risk of how we're seen. You know, we, we rely on others, financial sectors, bank. We need banks. We need to be bankable too. So we need to think about um, some of those things. Uh, there was a comment. I'll just close. Um, but but you know, do we want to be in the tent or do we want to be on the sideline? And to that point, I will um, acknowledge the the point that was made about MIA. When this topic came up, MIA, MIA was slack. You know, we did not um, acknowledge the, the magnitude of what we we're dealing with. We didn't sign up to the partnership. We didn't have a seat at the table. Um, you guys did. And without the support from Beef and Lamb, our voice wouldn't have been heard. So we're trying to lift our game there too. Um, so, yeah, that's really uh, all I can add. Thanks, Pete. I didn't quite give clarity around, so look, this is a vote of no confidence, and it's specifically around Haywaka. The process for this would be a show of hands. This is non-binding. Um, as I clearly stated to Hugh, I spoke to him in Wanaka, there is two remits sitting that will indicate what the board should do with Haywaka and or Waka Adrift anyway. So I questioned the value of this process. Anyone else want to speak to this remit? Bryce, uh, this... Motion, I should say. Bryce McKenzie. Uh, thank you. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Bryce McKenzie from Otago. I felt a bit left out on this table. I hadn't said anything. So I thought I'd better get up and say something. <laughs> um, that's not the case at all, actually. Uh, I guess what you're seeing here from you today is a frustration rather than anything else. And a lot of us feel that frustration. Um, I can remember, uh, by the way, I better declare I'm a dairy farmer. And uh, I feel a bit of an imposter, but I do pay levies to beef and lamb. <laughs> but um, I, I watched uh, the dairy industry get accused of being dirty dairy and run away. And uh, we still live with that because um, it left an impression for the New Zealand public that we were dirty because we didn't fight it. Now, what we've got here right now is a lack of confidence. Um, and people are frustrated at not being listened to. And I, I think that's exactly what Hugh is trying to indicate, that, that we need to be listened to, and there needs to be a whole readjustment on how beef and lamb operate. And Jane has talked about uh, the fact that you need to have an independent, uh, somebody look at the whole system. But I think that goes right through farming. I think that we need to have a united voice, otherwise we'll get separated as we have done in the past. Uh, just a couple of comments on some of the things that have happened so far. I see 120 million to run HWIN. If there's uh, 15,000 farmers, that's $8,000 a farm as it is. So there's going to be quite a lot of, lot of money involved to do anything. So that's all I have to say, thank you. Yeah, how much time do we need, guys? Because um, is it going to influence the vote either way? Ten seconds. Ten seconds, Jason, and then I'll come to Hamish. Hamish Del Tor. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, well, I'm really feeling guilty because I'm now seriously would have been the last person not to say anything on this table. But everything that I feel like saying has been said, but I, I do feel it's important for the board's benefit that um, you know that we all do say and reiterate what's already been said. I think um, that what's missing 
in terms of what the board, what the board are. Firstly, I'd say that um, it is a sad situation that we've got this vote of no confidence, but just backing up what Bryce has said, it's clear why, because grow, uh, farmers out there just uh, feel disenfranchised, confused, and and, ju and seriously do have no confidence. So, um, so how do we address that? I think um, one way that you could make farmers feel a hell of a lot more uh, enlightened was by addressing the fact that there's two completely uh, opposing views on methane and and climate issues. And if you would, if you truly got all the experts in uh, that it, which you say you have, uh, I don't think there'd be a farmer in the country that could tell you who you bought in. Uh, let alone what they were saying. But if you put the two arguments in front of farmers, in front of your shareholders, and let them make a decision, I think it would be a hell of a lot more helpful. Like, I personally think that the whole methane thing is literally w w what it is, a, a lot of gas. But and, and there's sound science to prove that, but there's nobody... Uh, from beef and lamb thumping the table about that, even as an option for people to choose what they think, and then so the government all yeah they're quite happy. They think oh well we we all believe the, the party line, but I'll bet you if you put up the options for farmers, uh, you, you know you'd get engagement, and um, and we wouldn't be where we are. Um, yeah, I think um, oh, there's a few cliches you could use. I mean turkeys don't vote for Christmas, so you're not going to get us, uh, uh, you know, any sane person signing up to something that's going to cost him $8,000 a year or whatever it might be. And another cliche that comes to mind is, you know, a flood is just an accumulation of, of raindrops. If we think as individuals we can't make a difference, then we might as well just bugger off. We Together, we can make a difference. Um, so, yeah, thanks for your day. Thank you. Jason Barrier. Yeah, just, um, well, a point of correction, really. Uh, thanks, Nikki, for your comments. That, that listening would be very welcome. And to Peter, um, this, this comment about doing nothing is not an option. I, I haven't heard any speaker today proposing that we do nothing, and yet I've heard it three times as a defence of whatever, H, when, doing nothing is not an option. We need to get past that. No farmer is talking about doing nothing. What we're talking about is doing it better. If I can respond, I said the risk of doing nothing. Okay. Okay, um, Hugh's got one minute right to reply, then we will take a vote by a show of hands. Just one minute, thanks, Hugh, because it was... Yep. Oh, sorry. I missed the earlier presentation, but I know that Nestle has been held up as a, an example of somebody who has uh, endeavoured to convey to New Zealand that they have to, to keep up and keep ahead. And then yesterday's paper, Nestle was, was, was singled out as being one of the the worst 11 international corporates uh, for, for not walking the talk when it comes to uh, uh, their environmental f and uh, climate change footprint. Uh, Danny Hales from Alliance has stood it publicly in Gore and he said that, of, um, and they're the largest sheep meat producer in New Zealand, and he stated uh, without doubt that the, the programs they're running through their, their hand-picked, their... their um, um, uh, uh, meet assurance programs, etc. Uh, nobody has ever questioned uh, any more about the footprint, and they have absolutely no difficulty selling meat around the world. So I think we need to keep uh, reality front and foremost, as opposed to some of the rhetoric coming out of uh, marketing people who may well have uh, an opposition view for their own uh, advantage. Thank you. Okay, sorry, just missed one. Did I, Christine? Paul, crap. Last one, then we will put it to a show of hands. Yeah, look, thanks, Andrew. Thanks, you, uh, and thanks to everyone that's spoken. And, and I guess I, I can, I certainly want to acknowledge the frustration that's been articulated in the room today, both as a farmer councillor and as a, as a levy payer. And, and look, to be really honest, uh, us as farmer councillors, when, when we've been in meetings with the board and the management team, and we've shared some of those frustrations. You know, at times we've felt like we've been banging our heads against a brick wall trying to get our point across of where we believe what the action that the organisation should be taking. So I, I totally get that. 
But equally, and I just wanted to bring a bit of balance to this, we also get to see all the good things that happen inside the organisation. How hard the people are working across the spectrum, not only with regards to Hewaki Kinoa, but there's a whole range of activities that go on in this organisation. So I think it's really important that we just remember that balance and about what's actually going on and happening. So we hear your frustrations, and from a Pharma Council perspective, we understand that, and we have been articulating a lot of that. So, but there's always a flip side. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, look, we'll call it there because we're just. Why? Yep. Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Okay. We can take a vote now. Can we have a show of hands? Who is going to count this? Okay, so all that support the motion, please raise your hand. <laughs> yep, all that oppose the motion, raise your hand, board members can't vote. Okay, so. Hey. Okay, keep your hands raised. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The numbers are. Yep, so the majority have not supported the motion. Um, thank you, Hugh, for presenting that. Look, I, I get it, guys. Shit, I'm a farmer too. Yeah. No, they don't. And you would have known that, uh, I'm saying, Bryce, because we gave Hugh the option of putting this up as a remit and would have got people the opportunity to vote through the remit process. Bringing it to a meeting, it is only those involved in the room. At the time the remits were being put up, I did have a specific conversation uh, with Hugh uh, around putting this up as a remit because actually um, having a show of hands or um, voices actually up to the chairman's discretion. So it, Andrew has elected to put that up today, but he didn't have to, so I'd be really clear about that. And, and to be honest, it's actually... You know, we've got another two or 3,000 farmers who have actually voted uh, who obviously don't have any input in what today is. So it is just the mood of the room today, and that's all it can be. So I just, just wanted to be clear that you did have that opportunity at the same time I spoke to all of you on your remits. Are you comfortable with that, Bryce? Cool. Can I ask another question about remits? Yep. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a little bit perplexed about your remit. So I understood, and correct me if I'm wrong, that a remit uh, was something that the majority of people voted on at an annual meeting to actually um, bring change to an organisation or uh, vent their um, anguish at what was happening and, and uh, make change. Uh, I cannot understand. Are, are the remits are not binding, is that correct? Yeah, the, so just for clarity, the remits were put out to all of sheep and beef, well, all of New Zealand, our beef and lambs levy payers and were voted online and have been voted in the room today if people haven't voted online. Yeah, so I understand at, at actually, that. Yeah. I understand that. So if the remits have a majority of uh, people in favour of them, do the board have to enact them? No, and that was written in the pack too that the remits are, are non-binding. They are for the board to consider their action afterwards and this was the importance of getting the sentiment in the room today. Okay, so if, if that was to change, if somebody was to want uh, remits from the majority of the shareholders to be binding, how would you go about doing that? Well, you would have to change constitution and you might have to put some thresholds in that constitution around number of votes that you'd have to secure from your levy payers, like a significant transaction proposal. So would that take, if you were going to do that, I presume it would have to be done at an annual meeting. So. 
would that be something you would propose uh, a meeting now to have uh, discussed and put through at the next annual meeting? Uh, no, we'll... Sorry, Cross? I can answer that. <laughs> a remit can be put at any time, so a special meeting can be called. Uh, so it would require, I believe, a minimum of... And look, I'll have to just confirm that off the top of my head. It would be a minimum of 5% of farmers... Um, but that can call a special meeting out of session. So just like any company, shareholders um, can actually schedule and call a meeting. Okay, so, but I'm more concerned about what's binding and what's not binding. Yeah, well, today today isn't binding. Right. But, but, but look, to be honest, you know, if people can't read the room, you know, I guess <laughs> that's what today is about, is actually listening and hearing. So I, I find it hard, believe it, or walk away from here saying, well, we're not going to pay any attention to everything. That's the board's decision. But, you know, that's the point of getting this sort of feedback. OK. Uh, yeah, sorry, I just... Uh, other annual meetings I've been involved with, often remits are binding, so if the majority of people vote something in, then it is put into action. Yeah, that, that might be correct for some, but not the way the Constitution okay. for Beef and Lamb says. So we need... The Constitution would need to be changed. Uh, look, it's still... If, if the um, if a different number of votes had um, if it had been structured slightly different to what than how the remit had come through, then it could have been binding. It would have been a different meeting. But certainly, what's been proposed, and with the number of supporters, isn't that that isn't actually uh, doesn't make it a binding resolution for this meeting. Uh, can you explain yeah. that in a little bit more in detail? How something could have come through that was going to be binding? Uh, so just be a greater number. Basically, it's a great, and that's that sort of 5% threshold, so it's a much higher group of numbers than the 10, 20, 25 supporters that would have come through on those. I, okay. I can... Right. I, any other general business? Lindy. Uh, Lindy Nelson. She can be farmer Ikatahuna. Um, Andrew, I'm going to propose a different vote, and it's a vote of thanks to you for your leadership over the last few years. I don't want you leaving here today with your mana not intact. It is very easy for leadership to, you know, for us to be critical of leadership. And we all know that we don't work in perfect environments. We don't often get the choice of what we have to lead. And so I just want to leave you with a little quote um, before I ask for a vote of thanks for your leadership. And it's by Theodore Re Roosevelt. And as long as I can actually get it up on my phone. It is not the critic who counts, nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust, sweat and blood, but who strives valiantly. Thank you, Andrew, for your leadership during a time where you've had to be in an arena that you probably didn't want to be in. And with that, I'd like to vote, propose a vote of thanks for Andrew and his leadership. Do I have a seconder? <laughs> Thank you, Lindy. Um, I, uh, if, if we've got no more general business, I might move into the period of acknowledgements, but if we've got some more general business, we can do it. If it's acknowledgements, we can do it during then. It's just a general business point of view. Um, hey, look, I, I really thank these people. Everybody's come up and everybody's put a remit in. Not one single remit has been um, just off the cuff. You know, tremendous amount of thought. Farmers will have been driving their tractors thinking about this remit in their head all the time. Jason, I thought your, your remit was tremendous, absolutely tremendous, mate. Um, but these guys, Hamish has come up from Southland, well, both Hamishes, uh, they've both come up from Southland and they've come up here and they've paid their own way. And I think if, if people have got enough to put a good remit in to a beef and lamb AGM, I think uh, they should be, I think they should be, uh, they should be provided with transport and accommodation here. Because th 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 these guys have made this meeting, they've made this AGM, they've, they've had a chance to say exactly what they feel, and it's been tremendous. Thanks very much. Thank you, Graham. <laughs> Graham Gleeson. 
Can I leave that proposal for the new board to discuss? <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, I'd like to just follow on from those last two uh, people. Uh, so on behalf of the uh, remit proposers, thank you uh, to Beef and Lamb New Zealand, the board, uh, the management, uh, for allowing you to have an extended AGM so that we could be fairly heard and for these sort of uh, points to be well discussed. So thank you very much. Thanks, Graham. <laughs> Look, the big loser today is Jared Coogan and Brian Hocken because we were going to go on a farm tour. And so, look, I want to acknowledge them for giving us the ability to change the day. And I'd like, you know, as so I gave Brian a ring and I said, look, oh, well, I've, I said the board would commit to come up as a board and have a visit around, um, around, around Brian's farm. Unfortunately, I won't be there to visit, but I'll just have to come up personally. <laughs> so thank you for enabling us that, Brian and Jared. Okay, so acknowledgements. Look, I'd like to welcome Geoffrey Young, the newly elected Southern South Island Director, who's taking, taking office at the end of this meeting. Geoff, would you like to come forth, say a few words? Thank you, Mr Chairman. So firstly, it's uh, you, Andrew, that I would uh, like to acknowledge and thank all the work that you've put in over the last nine years, uh, particularly the, the last six years as chairman. So we do thank you for that. And that's uh, a genuine thank you from me. Um, of course, uh, the, there has been a mood for change, not only in the South, but right throughout New Zealand. Uh, democracy has worked in the, the southern ward, and um, we, we have, a, have a change of director there. So there's no animosity there, Andrew, but I do thank you uh, for all the work you've done, and I wish you well for your any future endeavours. <laughs> right. Um, look, uh, secondly, <clears throat> and most importantly, I'd like to uh, thank all my supporters from the southern region. Um, Many of them have put their shoulders to the grindstone to make uh, make the selection really worthwhile and get the result that they were after. So I certainly thank you all, but especially the levy payers, the grassroots farmers that have have stepped up and voted, and they've they've made this change possible. So thank you to all those grassroots farmers. <clears throat> and lastly, but not least, I would uh, certainly. Thank the board for welcoming welcoming me on board uh, the way they have. I've met you all now and and had a chance to have a chat to you. I can assure you I'm not coming in with a big stick to uh, stir you up completely, but I do want unity there in the boardroom, um, and, and my wish is to have unity with Federated Farmers and Dairy NZ along with Beef and Lamb. I think we can work a lot better. So... Um, to the board, I think that we all understand there is a mood for change today and hopefully we can move forward together on that. Uh, to the staff, I've met you, Cross, there yesterday. Good to catch up with you again, Sam. Um, there's a great team behind you people and I really look forward to uh, working with you all. So it is, it's a fabulous team to meet and to be part of. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, okay, next person I'd like to acknowledge is David Servar. Dave is not with us. David was MIA representative from the Alliance Group. Have I got them out of order? Yes, I have. Um, sorry about that. Um, so David did a year with us and then completed his employment period with Alliance, so he's moved off to Australia. But David was excellent. It is massive value having a meat industry association uh, CEO in the room to get that whole of supply chain view of the world. I know there was some contentious discussion about that a number of years ago. It is unbelievably invaluable. I want to thank David and I want to welcome Pete Connolly to the room. You got to hear Pete before. These guys are busy guys, CEOs in our major meat companies to give their time for industry is much appreciated. So if you could just welcome Pete to the room with a, a round of applause. 
George Tatham stepping down after nine years. We're getting a bit sick of saying nice things to George because we said some nice things at the board meeting, but then he's not leaving now because because of the extended election period for the um, Eastern North Island, George is committed to stay on until that process runs its course. We'll be signalling, well, the board will probably be signalling that next week when we're going to re-engage that election process. George has been fantastic. George is like a rock. Um, words of wisdom. Done. He originally came and said he was going to do six years, ended up doing nine years, and uh, <clears throat> a massive contributor. David, can I ask you if you wanted to say a few words? You were asking if you could before as a as a levy payer in George's region. Can you hear me now? Yeah, um, today's been very much about the future, but I'd just like to step back in time a little bit to 10 years ago. And um, Mike Peterson, who was our East Coast rep on Beef and Lamb, signalled that he was going to step down. Um, I happened to bump into George in town, and I said, how's your application for standing for Beef and Lamb game, George? And George, in his very considered way, says, yeah, I'm thinking about it, Dave. And then about another month, I was at a meeting and George happened to be there. And I says, how's that application going from Beef and Lamb, George? He says, yeah, I'm thinking about it. And the, the election came along and then George was successful and he's been successful ever since. Um, I don't think you've ever been contested for that East Coast seat, George. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, George is a very humble person. But with my role when I was looking at the independent remuneration for Beef and Lamb directors, I looked at the workload of directors and George, along with some of the Beef and Lamb directors, his workload was absolutely staggeringly phenomenal. What George did for Beef and Lamb Genetics, just to name one, plus some of the other workloads he took on that are just hidden from most of us in this room, he was a tremendous contributor. So George, thanks for your time. We often talk about the importance of youth on these boards in the industry. George was pretty young at the time. He had a very young family, a very supportive wife and Sarah, and George put that all to one side, plus a significant business on the East Coast out at Foriyama, and he gave everything to beef and lamb. So George, thanks for your nine years. It's greatly appreciated from a levy payer's perspective. Okay, Hayden, now Glenn, I'm going to have to apologise to you, mate, because this morning when I introduced directors, I forgot to get Glenn to stand up and identify himself. So Glenn McDonald, if you'd like to stand up now. Glenn as our Associate Director on Beef and Lamb New Zealand. Glenn's from Roxburgh, down Roxburgh Way. The Associate Director role that Beef and Lamb has, has initiated has been, I think, one of the most exciting things that we've done as a board. And I'm not saying that flippantly because we have had some absolutely stunning individuals that come through. They get full speaking rights and full contribution rights. They just don't get to vote because they don't have the responsibilities. So, Glenn, welcome. Do you want to say anything, Glenn? Do you want to say a few words? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. I'm going to do a bit of a wrap up, but it's got Kate. Would you like to come and acknowledge me? <laughs> Well, Lindy sort of stole my uh, thunder a wee bit before, but I'm just going to stand up here on behalf of the organisation and the board and just acknowledge that this will be Andrew's last meeting as chair of Beef and Lamb. Andrew served the board for nine years and he's chaired for the last five. And it has not been an easy five years. And I think that's just clear from what we've heard today. So through a period of unprecedented regulatory challenge and change, Andrew has forged relationships at all levels of the sector on farm, within industry, and within government. So he is the ultimate ambassador for our industry, and the value of the ongoing relationships that he's formed are immeasurable. So his leadership and his mana have served us well through an incredibly trying time. And regardless of whether we like the outcomes or not, as we've heard today, the challenges that we face are ongoing and unrelenting. And just know that we are all better off today for Andrew's commitment and dedication to our industry. Andrew, on behalf of the board, we thank you for your leadership and we genuinely hope that you continue to serve the sector in some way. So please join me in acknowledging and thanking Andrew for nine years of dedicated service to making sheep and beef farming better in New Zealand.
Okay, guys, I'm going to have to watch I don't get emotional when I give this last piece because this has been all-consuming to me for nine years, and I'll be honest about that. I entered with a young family. Um, just want to give you a bit of a sense of it, though. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This has been a massive nine years, guys. You look at the political uh, environment, both domestically and globally, through those years. You look at our domestic politics here, you know, the, the impact of a significant uh, Labor, Green, New Zealand's first led government in its, in its first period, and then latterly a government with a 66-seat majority supported by Greens, supported by, please don't report this, in a completely ineffective opposition party. Now, we were just thrown to the wolves and policy. Now, you guys can criticize, and I, I can be slightly brutal now because I'm leaving the room, but you guys can criticize us as much as you want. You try work in an environment like that and see how you're going to get on. So we can stand here and say, I wanted you to be harder. I wanted you to tell the government to piss off, whatever. We fought diligently to get the best outcomes for our sector, and this has been all-consuming. Overlay that, a major biosecurity incursion in New Zealand being the Bovis, we had to decide whether we were going to get rid of that. What was going to be the impact on your sector? What was going to be the parallel impact on another sector? And that was a hell of a decision to make and has been a hell of a program that has impacted some farmers devastatingly so that we've enabled to try and keep bovis out of our country. So let's acknowledge how hard that was on some of those individually affected properties. I mean, that was brutal, guys. What choice did we have? Okay, overlay a global pandemic. Pete referenced there, you know, we were all at Wanaka Show on the 15th of March, 2020, 26th of March, we all went into lockdown. We had a whole bunch of stock still out on plants. The, the early meetings with MPI were discussing diggers and euthanisation plans for stock on, on farms and the subsequent mental health impacts of that. If we could not facilitate essential service provisioning with these guys, we were going to be toast as a country and as a sector. And holy shit, that was relentless through that period. And that was supply chain, food, food and fibre supply chain either side. So it enabled the transport, it enabled the fertiliser, because I don't remember, if you remember, we were in a drought that year, so there was no way we could keep that stock on, killing at 50%, you know, processing rates and have anywhere enough feed to feed them through the season. So we facilitated fertilising airplanes and essential services. If there's one sector that's absolutely covered itself in glory, it's the processing sector, because that year we had an export revenue from our red meat sector. I'm trying to give you guys a bit of a context, because we've been sitting in here arguing about one thing today. It's around advocacy. There is a whole, and that's appropriate. There is a whole bunch of other stuff that impacts our lives that we have to consider the importance of roles as we do the likes of votes of no confidence. The fact that we got that export revenue uh, year that year was, was, was just phenomenal. Okay, the other sector, we're talking about bringing sectors together, Red Meat Profit Partnership. What a great initiative that then subsequently enabled Farm Assurance Non-Regulatory NZFAP that we can then build a system, taste pure nature, and create value in market with your processing buddies. It's the sector working together. The other big take out of that was EASDs. When COVID hit, my truck driver would refuse to take a paper-based EASD. So let's, let's celebrate what we've achieved, for crying out loud, guys, because I don't want you leaving this room grumpy. It's been a tough day today, and we've had a lot of discussion around advocacy, but there are so many other things. Okay, so... NZFAP, Taste Pure Nature, and we heard that from Greg and um, from Nick this morning. So look, the more stuff we can do together and get better as a sector as opposed to fragmenting and arguing, it's going to make our sector better. FTAs, that was brutal, that negotiation. It was quite interesting, Sam said, is Vangeli still in the room? He was, he was distraught, that guy. He got through COVID three times negotiating those two FTAs for us. That was his commitment to your industry. And then when he couldn't get a, a suitable deal on uh, beef access into uh, the EU, he was personally devastated. You know, he sweats blood for our industry, that guy. So I just want to, you know, give you guys a sense of that. Um, 
also thing is the yeah, investment in R&D, like we put up these, this panel this morning. We do not have a future if we do not invest in R&D. So that was an excellent session this morning, Dan, to give a sense of the importance of that. Finally, the thing I'm most proud, well, the two things I'm most proud of is our maturity and, and uh, our Murray agribusiness involvement because, I'll be honest, we haven't understood how to engage with our Murray agribusiness levy pays. And so to have Baden on the board and to be growing maturity around that is just fascinating. And we need to do that. We're letting ourselves down as a sector if we don't do that. And then finally, the sector cohesion. We can try and divide. I can tell you what, with a 66-seat majority in government, we could have achieved nothing if we didn't come together. Now, everyone can have an opinion. We will be judged by our actions. And I know people may have different views on that. When I joined the board in 2014 with George, you can attest to this, George, we didn't have a relationship with Dairy NZ at all, did we? Jim vanderpoel has been texting me during the day. Nathan Guy's been texting me during the day. They all knew this was going to be a pretty brutal day for our sector, and they wanted us to come out of this all right. So just put some context around that. You know, that farming leaders, the ability to get in and try and influence change with government is still your strongest strategy, I believe, I believe, as opposed to just telling them to piss off and we'll argue with them. So that's what I would challenge people to consider. Things that I'm concerned about as I leave the room, those are things that I'm proud of. The things I'm concerned about is a biosecurity, just have a wee think around how many times you hear about things like Tyleria, clover root weevil, pea, uh, pea weevil, um, potato mop top virus. We've been blessed in our sector. We've only had bovis to date and clover root weevil. This will be a massive challenge for us. EASD's traceability is something that we've got to take seriously because we do not have good traceability on our ovines. EASD's enabled that. We've got to get better on bovines. The other thing that I'm leaving the room concerned about is us, as people. And let's be quite clear around this guy. I was talking to Fraser this morning and I said, what I love coming in here is shaking people's hands and looking them in the eye and knowing we've got a great sector. We are not behaving like a great sector. We are fragmenting and we are fighting and we are not serving our sector well. And that is us. So that's why we facilitated the day today so that we can listen. We know what our last six years have been like. You may guys may not have a sense of what our last six years have been like, how brutal it is, but we needed to come and listen today so that we can reset. But I want to challenge you all as you leave the room, have a think about how your behaviours impact your sector. I personally and professionally have no time for dis or misinformation this or misinformation or statements that personalise and divide our sector. So I'm saying that as an individual and I'm being quite strong around that. Anyone that uses tactics like that, I have got no time for it. And I think it's time our sector starts calling that out. We are a values-based sector. Kirsten Bryant used to tell me this. Kirsten was one of my mentors. Now, Kirsten used to guide me, and that was one of the things that she was most proud of, is the values base of our sector. I would challenge we are moving away from that, and I want to challenge you all to get back in the space, because it's not a good path to go down if you trans if you get off that pathway. So what does our sector want to be look like? What does our sector want to look like? What do we want it to be? I don't know. You decide that. You know, I remember when Damien came into his role as Ministry of Primary Industries, I, we felt he didn't have a sec uh, vision. So we asked him in to speak about his vision. I kind of want, I don't really want to state a vision for the sector. We have this vision for beef and lamb. I want you all to go away and have a think about what you want your sector to be and how you're going to behave in it. Finally, I really, uh, this is where I'll get emotional. <laughs> I want to acknowledge the people. You know, you do not have a more dedicated staff than at Beef and Lamb New Zealand. You do not. And when you compromise them by your criticisms and the likes, that's really hard to take. Think about your impact on people that work relentlessly on policy and don't always get it right and they get criticised. Just consider how that plays out. You go and visit that fourth floor, walk around that floor and look at the dedication of all those individuals there. So if you ever question that, I would, I would strongly challenge you that you've got it wrong. 
And then finally, the beef and lamb team, the board, what a great team. I'm really confident leaving the room. It doesn't worry me because we've provisioned for this. Kate Ackland or whoever is voted in, we've got multiple. I've used Kate because he's the deputy director, uh, deputy chair. We've got multiple capable directors in there, which I'll finish this meeting now. They will walk outside and they will vote a new chair in, and your sector will be in good hands. So, look, thanks very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Okay, so uh, do I just announce the 2024 annual meeting, the location? Have we got that? Just North and South Island. Northern South Island. It'll be in Kate's ward next year. We do north, south, and move around the wards. So that will be the Constitution re uh, requires we rotate it. Um, thank you for your participation. I will declare the formal meeting closed and, and uh, welcome Baden. Is Baden still with us, Charles? No, Charles, can you come to the stage and finish up with the uh, karakia and formalities? Oh, well, kia tato, and um, sorry you all drew the short straw as Baden had to go and catch a flight. Um, Charles Taito, I'm the Māori Agribusiness Advisor for Beef and Lamb New Zealand. Um, it's been a, an amazing day. Um, I don't know if many of you know, but I've been on a number of different Māori incorporation boards and had some pretty tough AGMs myself. Um, so it was good not to see water bottles thrown across the room, um, brawls across the, the kai table, and um, and I see there's no blood. So I think we've actually, um, you've managed to traverse yourselves today in an absolutely um, a, a, a very awesome manner, and it's been great to be part of my, my first AGM as a, a beef, and bland, beef and lamber. So... Um, I'd just like to close with, with, a, with a karakia. Um, the, the karakia is very similar to the song, and I thought it's quite fitting, um, As um, and it sort of sounds like a bit of an obituary for Andrew, but he is moving on. Um, he's not moving on from this world, but um, he is moving on uh, from from beef and lamb. So, um, uh, ki noi tato. Ko rangi e tū nei, ko papa e hora nei, mā tini mā mano e rapa te whai, ko whai te mārama tanga, ko whai ngā hua, ke puta ki te whai i ao, ki te ao mārama, a hui e tāike. Nō reira, tēnā tātou katoa. Kia ora.